thank you much. It's nice that you are you are you're okay in round. Uh, hey, Mr. Oliver Tambo um, is um, yeah. nowhere to be seen. Eh? <laughs> I'm there. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to go. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, I missed the uh, accreditation. Uh, I'll, I'll pick that up later. Um, so that, that's um, I hope that was useful. Uh, we'll be looking um, to my success. They will send the recording. They said. Okay, that's that's fantastic. Look forward. Yeah. So we're going to start in the next uh, one minute. Uh, Dr. Mwambo, Jonathan, how are you? I'm fine, Professor. How is uh, Kitwe? Ah, Kitwe is fine. How is Uganda there? Uganda is uh, okay. All right. Yeah, we, okay. are, we, are, we, are, we are partially locked down, but we are okay. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Glad, glad to hear Uganda is, um, is in the footsteps of Tanzania. Because now you've got number two, number two and three. Yeah. Three main. And the national bosses. Yeah, so so it's it's actually beating Tanzania now in terms of female involvement in the right, top they're one, they're, they're one step behind. Yeah, you are oh. in the, you are in the right place, one step behind. Okay. <laughs> Never forget that. <laughs> Thank you. I want to check whether Aquafish is ready. Can you, uh, Professor Kasam or Professor Kaunda, are you are you online? Yes, we, we are online. Uh, okay. Can you share your screen so that when I, I kick off this, the meeting, we, we start straight forward? Yes, I'll, I'll let our Director of Quality Assurance, who is going to present the work for Aquafish. So, yeah. Dr. Can, can you share the screen? So this meeting is going to start now. Uh, uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, uh, in this meeting. We're going to have uh, uh, four presentations from you. One, the first one will be from Aquafish. Then the commercialization of research output will be uh, uh, shared by Sesam. And then Sasid will present on research and innovation and the creates will follow on innovation on, on uh, research and innovation from incubation centers. Then we shall have a call, question and answer session before we get a presentation from the student from Aquafish. And thereafter, we will give time for Technopolis to, to present uh, and share findings from the recent education process uh, with the view of receiving feedback, but also getting questions from the essays. So with these few remarks, I invite uh, Aquafish to share their screen and start their presentation. So just excuse us, but uh, our colleague is coming on board. All right. You're sharing your desktop rather than uh, the screen, the, the, the document itself.
Is everything okay with Aquafish? Dr. Kazim, are you there? Or I can share and you, you talk on my slide. Maybe try to share, Prof. Kassam. Are you able to see yeah. it now? Yeah, that's okay now. It's, it, it can okay. be seen from here. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Great. Oh, sorry for the hiccup. Um, um, I, I, I will be sharing the experiences that uh, we have drawn from our uh, international accreditation of the two programs, uh, the PhD uh, Masters in, uh, in Fisheries and Aquaculture Science. And I'll take you through just an overview of uh, how over time we have uh, gone through the, uh, you know, uh, the accreditation process. And then I will explain the uh, general process with the specific actions that we we had to undertake. But then I will, from there, draw some lessons that we have had from this process, but also the kind of benefits that we have reaped from the process. And finally, I will show you the joy that we have had at the end of it all. Um, our process, um, though this is not necessarily the, the part of the ACAS process, but uh, I think- I'm not sure if your screen is shared. Did you stop sharing? No, I'm sharing. Uh, no, Dr. Kazem, you're not sharing. I was the one who shared, so I thought you were talking to my slides. But now- oh, is that so? <laughs> okay. Can you, can you share yours? I shared mine. This is this is mine. Are you able to see? No, yours is not coming. Okay, let, now just give me the a minute to do the share. Um, or, or what can happen? happen is, let him talk. Oh, I can I can still share mine and you just yeah. the next slide. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Let of, of course I'm sure. Uh, Dr. Kazembe, can you stop sharing? I've, I've stopped sharing. No, the screen I see here is yours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Then let me go with this. Yes. Oh. You, you, you are still sharing yours. I can't. No. Okay. Yeah, I've stopped now. Yeah, <laughs> let me share. Let yes. me share from here. Yes. Can Can you see that? Yes, I can yeah, see we can that. See it now. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe I can go to the next slide. Uh, next slide. Yes, I have said about that slide. You can go to the next one. Yes. So I say the passage was just an enabler in the sense that uh, we were able to, you know, get some, um, you know, recommendations regarding uh, the, the state in which our institution is, but most importantly, this very last bullet uh, on the man, uh, information management system that we are lacking in the university uh, prepared us to, to see the need for having information together. I, I think that was an, an important lesson that we had drawn from the, uh, the passage process. We can go to the next one. Right, so uh, chronologically, uh, we, we started the um, way back Therefore, in terms of the actual process of our cars in February 2019, uh, when it started with inquiries on what the process involves. And then in March 2019, Luana kicked off meeting, which preceded the formulation of a local working committee uh, within the university, which would allow meet regularly and share uh, what was needed to uh, you know, put up an application together. And again, 
in March 2019, we had to undertake a self evaluation process. And this process was uh, perhaps uh, one of the most important uh, to in order to qualify for the next stage. And then subsequently, after review of the self evaluation report, which we sent to ACAS, they are followed the site visits uh, to our institution. Then uh, in 2019, uh, we achieved at least the initial um, uh, qualification, uh, rather initial accreditation, but that was given with some conditions which were required to um, fulfill. And then finally in May 2021, we were given some comments to address and then we gave them, I mean, we addressed them and finally we got the um, accreditation. So that was in May 2021. So if you look at this process, basically has taken us maybe one and a half years um, to, to complete. Let's get to the next. So basically, if we are to summarize, step one was the safe assessment, um, uh, which uh, resulted into the output, uh, the, the safe assessment report, safe evaluation report. Um, then step two, the, uh, uh, they, they had to do the peer review um, through the site visit, and step three report uh, that summarized the results of the peer review and then the follow up to that, which were some recommendations which were supposed to fulfill. You can get next. Let me go now into the details of the self evaluation report. Um, in general, um, we needed to provide them with the uh, academic programs under review, and then data on students, alumni, alumni staff, um, resources quality assurance processes, and information on the student admission and others. But um, we also had to submit examination regulations, um, exemplary diploma supplement, evaluation reports of internal quality, assurance, and all the national accreditation. In our case, our national accreditation is called the National um, Council for Higher Education. Then further information uh, on the national higher education system, meaning that uh, our national education system and how our programs are fitting into that. Again, to be specific, now we had to submit Luana policies, and these policies included gender and quality assurance. Of course, there are others that also submitted, postgraduate handbook, photos of aquafish infrastructure, the newspaper adverts, uh, that to, I mean, that meant to show evidence that uh, we indeed publicize our programs, uh, invitation for uh, a call for admission and call for application for students or candidates to um, register with us. There's also a set of rules and regulations and conditions of service that we have to submit. The curricular for the PhD and MSc, including notes as well as assignments, but also some MOUs with the uh, the public, I mean the private sector, and also the evidence of publication, and also national um, officials and agriculture agenda, staff qualifications, evidence of national accreditation, and tracer study report. Uh, this is just to suggest a few of the policy documents that we had to, um, to submit. Uh, lucky enough, the tracer study we had just finished and that I think worked well for us. We can move to the next. Further steps involved the selection and nomination of the panel by ACAS consisting of at least four experts. These were two professors. So the ACAS had to put up with that team and this is called a team of experts. That team of experts had two professors, one labor market representative, one student, uh, specific preparation of experts for evaluation of programs 
under review by a case had to be done by ourselves. Then they produced a preliminary statement of experts, which were sent to Luana to prepare for discussions during uh, their visits to Luana. And then they made the site visit uh, with separate talks with the different stakeholders, including Luana staff, faculty, leadership students, and all that. So they came and did the site visits um, so that they gather evidence against our claims. Thank you. So we go to the next one. The expert team particularly had the following. A professor from University of Applied Sciences. Um, this is uh, uh, in Bremer uh, Haven, Alfred Wegener Institute, et cetera, et cetera. And Professor Dr. Han was part of it. Uh, Dr. Adrian Pierce, Pires was a part of it. Uh, Lena Fitch was also part, who was a student, was part of this team. So they came together, they did the site visits together. Let's go on. Now the reports. Report of the experts consists, or indeed consisted of the following chapters. First chapter was about policy and procedure for quality assurance. Then the quality of the curriculum. Uh, learning, teaching, assessments of, assessment of students, student admission, progression, recognition, and certification. Teaching staff, learning resources, and student support, and of course, some other information. And this is the report, the actual report of their evaluation. We'll go next. The nature of their decision. Experts gave, gave us, that team gave us a recommendation for the accreditation through the Accreditation Commission of ACAS, which is a decision-making body. Accreditation Commission decides, uh, have, have, can, can make decisions, one of the options here, unconditional accreditation, or indeed conditional accreditation, valid accreditation, some shortcomings, nine months to adapt the program, we were granted this decision uh, uh, upon our first uh, submission. Uh, but then there are also other possible decisions that they would have made. Lucky enough, we are given the second decision, which meant we had some work to do in order to fulfill some of our shortcomings. Go next. What are the real issues that they raised? Um, you know, they made the statement that the study programs like Okacha Master of Science and Aquaculture and Fisheries Science PhD offered by the University uh, of Agriculture and Natural Resources, Malawi, are accredited according to the ACAS criteria for program accreditation. The accreditations are conditional. The study programs essentially comply with the requirements defined by the criteria, and thus the standards and guidelines for quality assurance in the European higher education and the European qualifications framework in their current version. The required adjustments can be implemented within a time or period of nine months. The conditions have to be fulfilled. The fulfillment of the conditions has to be documented and reported to ACAS no later than 30th November 2020. So the accreditation is given for the period of six years and is valid until 30 September 2026. So this is what was written and uh, we had to work out with those conditions that they gave, but particularly I'll give you in the next slide what particularly they said we should pay attention to. They said both PhD and MSc, here are the conditions. The intended learning outcomes on a program level have to be described in a more elaborate way to, so, to, so, uh, to specify the profile of the graduates. I think this was one of our major shortfalls. The intended learning outcomes also have to include interdisciplinary and societal needs. What that meant is that we should not just focus on the technical side of aquaculture and physical science. We needed to look at a broader a horizon of the um, uh, within which the aquaculture and fisheries science is operating. 
This has to be done separately for the master program and the PhD program. Then there was a condition specific to master based, based on the outcome of the analysis of which courses are essential to achieve the learning outcomes on program level. It has to be shown how the overall learning outcomes are achieved by combination of modules, e.g. by using a matrix. Um, in the RFST submission, we didn't put that matrix, um, basically because it might have been alien to us. We didn't have much experience of mapping the programs versus outcomes. And so I think this they pointed out as one of the major shortfalls. It has to be guaranteed that students have sufficient knowledge in mathematics and statistics. This can either be done by uh, sharpening the admission criteria uh, or by expanding the amount of mathematics and statistics that are, um, in the curriculum. This is, is also another recommendation that was made. And that meant then we have this, the work to address uh, basically these three major recommendations or these conditions have to be fulfilled. You can go next. The module descriptions have to be revised, focusing on the following aspects. The intended learning outcomes have to be described in a more elaborate way. The type of examinations used must be clarified. So two issues here. Learning outcomes versus the assessment. We go next. How did we address them? Um, we had to figure out what they meant. We had to go and uh, review their, their um, uh, way of presenting curricula, i.e. the European way. And so we had to, to use what they call the Dublin descriptors with this matrix. And so what you have here are now the learning, uh, the intended learning outcomes at five different levels. Level one, knowledge and understanding, running all through to learning skills. So what that means is that we need then to show how these uh, Dublin descriptors are being addressed by each one of the, each one of the courses that we are trying to offer. And this is where the mapping issue is coming in. So we had to adjust our uh, learning outcomes uh, to uh, the learning outcomes that are in line with the European uh, you know, framework uh, for, um, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, the European qualifications framework. So we go next. So this is a sample of the um, outcomes for the, uh, for the PhD. We have done here the mapping. If you look at the horizontal first line, this is where we have got learning outcomes, one up to learning outcomes five. I have shortened them. These are just the same as those that I showed previously. And then I am showing you some letters within this matrix that represent E as outcome introduced, meaning that uh, this, this, this uh, course at this level is only introducing this outcome, and then R outcome reinforced and E outcome emphasized. So basically, this is the mapping that they made showing that uh, where do each one of these uh, required courses make a contribution in terms of learning outcomes. So the final um, submission well, actually was actually populated with these letters E, I, and R. Uh, almost each, each cell was filled. Here I'm just demonstrating uh, what that mapping meant. And I think this is where we drew indeed a lot of lessons um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, because we didn't have much of understanding of what really they wanted. But eventually, once, once we did this, I think they were happy with us. You can go next. What did we do right? Um, first thing is the team. Uh, we saw that Luana set up a nine member committee comprising director of quality assurance, and he, he is responsible for university QA processes. Uh, and of course, having uh, some time of experience, I think that had a lot of input to this process. 
Um, we had also center leader and deputy center leader who had the overall coordination of the processes. And I think they did really um, give a, a, you know, a tough time to the team to make sure that things are done. Head of department uh, had to oversee internalization of the process, making sure that every member of staff had to, ha had to have a role to play. As you see, those outcomes required that every member of staff had to understand them and see where, they, you know, where their uh, courses were fitting in terms of contribution to the achievement of the learning outcomes. Then we had also research and scholarship coordinator um, who is basically um, um, responsible for student research processes and learning processes and quality assurance coordinator for Aquafish. Then we had also resource mobilization coordinator, dean for postgraduate studies had also a role to play. Uh, each one of these in the team had uh, uh, actually responsibility to, in order to ensure that uh, the process was within time, but also done in the right way. And go next. Not forgetting. Um, they have site visitors actually to verify some of the claims made in the documents, and this is about infrastructure, as you can see here. Um, aqua, aquaculture and fishery science as a department is well, uh, you know, equipped, has the uh, necessary facilities to offer the programs that are, that were proposed and then that, that were under review by the International Accreditation Agency. Go next. But also Luana has the infrastructure in terms of classrooms, uh, administration blocks and all that. And the evidence was clear when they, they, they came here. Next. Um, these are hostels for students. Challenges. Luana curricula had traditionally followed objective oriented learning as opposed to outcome based learning. And that required us adjusting. That explains also part of the condition that we're given. Uh, documentation explaining the qualification gained might or was not easy as the country had not yet approved national qualification framework. And so you can see that even if they did so, um, the national qualifications framework, the qualifications framework against which we were also evaluated were those that are more relevant and clear within the European education system. And that again required that we adjust to fit both the national requirements and also uh, the European requirements. Solutions to the two was that we used the Dublin descriptors to satisfy the conditions on learning outcomes. I think that was a guiding principle for us to make sure that at least we understand what, what was meant by the condition that we're given. Get next. So, this whole process has the ultimate as well as approximate costs and benefits. We paid the total amount um, for 6,980 plus um, 7%, which were charged as upon signing, 7% had to be paid, and then 30% at the end of the accreditation once we have fulfilled the conditions. The admit or the proximate benefits that we have is that we have some improved curricular packaging. We have learned a lot, and this we are actually applying now in our process of curriculum review. The process of accreditation, lucky enough, uh, did coincide with the process of uh, um, our, our university-wide curriculum review, and we benefited quite a lot. Uh, we are revisiting some of the processes and indeed some of the elements that were addressed, uh, that, I mean, that were raised in the uh, international accreditation process. Quality assurance um, internalized as a shared responsibility. Um, traditionally, we have viewed quality assurance as a, a particular office's responsibility, but you can see that this whole process required that we have different offices coming together. And that gave us a view that I think if we are to achieve uh, some high degree of quality assurance results, 
we need to be working together, different offices working together. Um, it has also provided us with room for improved curriculum review processes. And of course, we have gained the capacity along the way, the capacity to, to do the, the quality processes, the capacity to develop um, learning outcomes, um, a curriculum based on the learning outcomes. I think we have really gained a lot. You can go next. Yeah, of course, basically, this process takes a bit longer, but uh, eventually you get what, what you get. And the fact that it has to go through all those stages, it takes a long time. Go next. Um, just a matter of recommendation. We see that transparency and provision of detailed and specific information was an important aspect of the process. We need to be aware of the leadership of the CER, which is the uh, Safe Evaluation Report. We have to get them into mind. And so when we are writing and giving the information, we must give as needed, as much as needed, so that they do not begin to question what is this, what is that. Make sure that you have the readership in mind. Uh, we need to add all information on the institution and the study programs that help understanding the program's concept. The proposal that you put in front, I think must be clear. Contact agency at any time during the procedure when questions on, on standards and procedures arise. It was actually in the hands of our deputy director of ACE to keep on asking the ACAS offices where things were not clear. And I think he worked quite hard on that part. So what I would recommend indeed is that make sure that you are in contact with them to understand what they need and what they mean by what they need. Go next. So the ultimate reward is what you see. We've been awarded the accreditation now without conditions. Uh, so we are all happy with this result. And thank you very much for your listening. Um, I hope we'll you will draw some lessons from this presentation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kazembe. Uh, Director for Quality Assurance, Silwana, uh, for a very good summary of the process that you, you went through. I'm sure colleagues will have a lot of questions and I would like to ask them to keep their questions because we're going to have the whole session on questions and answers and the people will be reacting to your presentation at the later stage. So don't go away if you, if you can. Uh, now I'm inviting Sesam to present the, their, their paper on commercialization of research. And here I want to get lessons from culture and the agribusiness uh, undertaking that is, is happening in Kenya. So George and Tim, are you around? Yes, we are there. I have not seen you. Your camera is off. Where's the camera? Where's the camera? Okay. You already you share, yeah. So oh. you're already sharing your screen, right? Yes. Can you see? Yeah, I've seen your screen. And I think others are also seeing your screen. Okay, so okay. I'll be brief. Um, that is our center with a lot of innovation pictures. Let's go. Um, I don't want to talk about this, but just to mention that we are focusing on agri-innovations and product development as one of the mission and objectives. And so we do our object, third, third objective focuses on incubation of technologies. And also the second objective recognizes innovation. So these are the two objectives that we are anchored on as we improve our growth science park innovation and commercialization. Um, just to share this to show that um, the innovation and commercialization we're talking about is not one combined thing, but it's a set of many activities that involves the number of students that we have supported, exchange work we have done with our partners, where our faculty and students have learned that, and also the industry partnership 
that we have four key industry partners that has worked with us. Besides that, we have internships we do with uh, our students and faculty in the industry. And with that combined is what helps us to work on some of innovations that are also demand driven from the industry. Go on. Um, we just, this is to share that we are graduated 88 students in 2020. And now we have uh, 12, some of whom you will see their pictures as innovators in this uh, presentation. Uh, we have five PhDs and seven MSCs who are graduating this year. This slide shows uh, our areas of innovations. In livestock sector, we are focusing basically on feed systems, innovation on formulation of feeds that are cheaper for farmers. In crops area, we are focusing on crop protection. And in food, we focus on value addition. And also we have an area which is very interesting a lot for upcoming the agribusiness entrepreneurship where our students, we are trying to win them out as entrepreneurs. And from our agriculture engineering, we are focusing on fabrications, trying to work on things that farmers and industry can pick up. So I'll show you some of them. One of the key uh, procedure for making sure that it continues a part of learning is what we have adopted. We call it experiential learning uh, by Lead, that leads to innovation. So encouraging students to work with farmers, do it practically, demonstrate. And with that process, they become better innovators because farmers and industry give them challenges and then they work around the challenges to come up with products which they can now commercialize. Uh, this slide um, just shows a few of the products that we have come up with, some are in the process, but very few of them we have tried to commercialize. The first slide, is, the first picture is a sorghum, and that sorghum is a certain, it's a, it was bred in Egerton here, it's a sorghum with low gluten, and is targeting that supermarket you see in front there, the bread, this is low gluten bread, very good for diabetics. And this is a product that is, we have started rolling out into the supermarkets that we are partnered with as a low level trial of rolling out to see the demand. Uh, the second uh, just shows the fingerlings for farmers. And uh, this is uh, producing various fingerlings that all farmers need in different, right? particularly the tilapia, which is a very high demanded by farmers and also the household consumption. The third are three bottles of something we call citrus blend, uh, orange marmalade, and uh, another one, lemon. Now, these are uh, uh, an innovation from our food science. It has a reduced uh, sugar from uh, gum arabic, uh, which is very good for diabetics as well. And uh, this is one of the products that students came up with with uh, their, uh, their, their lecturer. Now, I just want to jump the mushrooms. That's an ongoing program. But the, one of the products we have managed to commercialize successfully is this dryland bean varieties and peanuts that we already have commercialized with a company known as Faida Seed Company. And this is now in the market. Go on. Uh, other than those products that are basically processed products, we are also focusing on fabrications and we try to resolve farmer needs and farmer challenges. For example, the first photo is about a chaff cutter, which is a normal machine that is used and we fabricate here. But we have gone further to come up with a, a farmer is a user feed mixture. That's the machine that is being shown on the left on the right, which now can mix the things that have been cut from this chaff cutter plus other food feed supplements to come up with a ratio. And that's why we have a short course called feed formulation. 
Now, this is uh, the two photos also show fabricated machines. One on the left is about sorghum thresher. As you saw that we are focusing on uh, low gluten, producing sorghum for uh, bread and even the industry like breweries. Is this is a farmer-based thresher that can be used to thresh the way we, we thresh uh, or the way we, we thresh the maize. So it's easier. And then immediately after that, we have also developed a machine we call a winnower. This is a traditional thing we used to do, women used to do, to remove the chaffs from the good sorghum. So at the end of the day, the farmer can be able, or a group of farmers can be able to process and move this faster to the uh, consumers of the industry. In terms of uh, management of COVID, of course, we came across this period and we had to innovate. It's interestingly, this, the left one is um, a COVID sample collection booth. Uh, engineers, are, are graduate engineers are not experts in that health, but when the problem came, they innovated and came up with this sample collection booth. And also we have a sanitizer. Now, those are some of the products that we have come up with. I'll show you some of the challenges we face. But before that, the entrepreneurial component, we are using young, our students as young entrepreneurs. And we, are, we have a, prog a program of giving them a little fund after they come up with a product that is certified and can go to the market that we win them out with some little funding to be entrepreneurs and we'll follow them later on. So the first lady is working on uh, something we call Sky Cleaner. And this is an agri-enterprise student and they are working with a student of chemistry so that they are able to come up with a cleaning detergent. And the middle one is this mama lady you show. Those two ladies are from food science. And that pro they are now from coming out from that innovators to entrepreneurs. So we are also building entrepreneurial skills in them. And the last one is about those who are using ICT to try to pass agricultural knowledge. This is also another continuation of the same. And now they try to display more of a marketing product to show some of the varieties of products they see. The left one may not be purely uh, food or agriculture related, but it's using agricultural products to be able to come up with items that are market oriented. So in short, these are an, a variety of products and that we are already working on and ready to go out uh, that we now have to deal with the issues of commercialization. Now, the other day uh, after we featured these items, the popular magazine, that is the nation which is almost in the East African region, uh, Figure, featured the students as innovators and uh, coming out from research and going into business because we are focusing research innovation and entrepreneurship in, agri in agriculture. And uh, the lower one is showing the fabricated machine. And some of these are really go ready to go to the market and industry uh, having demand for them. Now, we have some challenges in the process, particularly in issue of uh, commercialization and rolling out. I want to just pick, I picked three because they are the key ones we are struggling with. The sorghum bread and the sugar reduced gum Arabic, which is really highly demanded with the industry, particularly the health sector. Uh, for the bread, the biggest challenge is the linkage with the supermarkets and the bakeries, uh, which the question is, they are looking for buying the flour and baking by themselves. Now, we realize that the income, I mean, the price they give us or what they want to give us as a, a payment is not able to cover what we call the cost of production because they are not able to produce enough flour. So we are going into production of the flour, but they, they, what they call the money we receive from them is much lower. So the university is trying to do an action-based plan because we have a catering sector that has um, a bakery. So we think that we can do it and also reach out to the supermarkets directly. 
it's a big, uh, it's like juggling the honey, the, the, the liver, but it's something we are doing. The second challenge is on uh, fabricated machinery. This was basically a demand-driven uh, innovation from farmers. But the challenge is the industry that is willing to take it up immediately is not there. So we try to sell it to farmers one at a time when they demand. But now we are reaching out to what we call Kenya Association of Manufacturers to try to identify, to help us uh, get uh, the industry that can take it up. The third one is on that marmalade. Because it's something ready to go, some of our students who are entrepreneurs started almost producing and selling this. That's what I'm calling informally as entrepreneurs. We are training as entrepreneurs, but we have this challenge. So we are, that's why we started something we are calling winning entrepreneurs. So we try to win them rather than them going formally and dealing with this thing in a more, uh, in a less formalized system is trying to link them with a financial institution, but also give them a seed money so that they can do it in a more formalized way. That shows that, that the industry that picks it is not immediately there. Go there. Now, I picked some of the lessons we have learned uh, when we try to reach out to industry to commercialize some of those mm -hmm. products we have. One of them, and I probably come on to many, is creating value. Now, creating value is what the consumer demands. First, that is what should be innovated and even take it to industry because the industry will never take something that has no demand at the end. And so we discovered the biggest thing that was very useful to have something like a PPP, private public partnership with them, which has an MOU. And that then they can be able to be promoters of your product. The second lesson is uh, there's something we call value capturing. Coincidentally, this is where the university, we are very weak. How do we price the innovation? And nobody has a good answer for this. So before you go to the industry, the industry expects you when you work with them that you will prod and then you get your role. The question is, what is your price? Nobody answered that question properly. So uh, I think some training or some short training on how do you value product innovation or service innovation or research innovation is something that is worth taking up. We realize this is our big weak link. Another good lesson we have learned is um, for those that have been commercialized like the seeds, the bean seeds, active MOU and an IPR policy, intellectual property right policy, which we have now at the university, those are the two things that are helping us to negotiate with the private sector as we do commercialization. Without those two active ones, it's very difficult. In fact, sometimes they run away with your product and tomorrow you find it in the shelves and it has a different name. The last one is capital market. Uh, the innovators are students and even farmers, are support, uh, even farmers who uh, demand certain products. They are also, private sector, they can also take up this. The challenge they have is how they link up with capital markets. Even as the university, as we say, we are going to start off our bakery to be able to compete and make value for our sorghum bread. The challenge is the capital market where the money, borrowing money is, they, don't, they believe the university has nothing to do with uh, investments in industry. So they only know the industry. So you must partner with the industry to be able to access capital markets. As I finish, these are our partners, and the big one that I have there is Kenya Association of Manufacturers, which is a very key one in trying to assist us in commercialization. I want to end there. I hope I've saved you time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Ward, for saving time, of course, but for a very good presentation. Uh, I'm impressed by the contribution of students to innovate, but also to attempt to commercialize. Now let's move on and keep your questions for the Q&A session. I invite now uh, the team from SASI to make their presentation on COVID-19 research and the innovation. I, 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 I'm, I'm expecting this also to be very interesting because of the COVID-19 
challenge that we were facing. So Misinzo and the Professor Mark, if you're ready, please. Okay, go ahead. So thank you, Jonathan. Uh, on behalf of uh, Professor Mark Rimam, the Executive Director of Science Foundation for One Health, I'll be making uh, this presentation. So as you put it, um, our talk will be on the SAST experience on uh, COVID-19 research and innovation. And my name is uh, Gerard Misinzo. So to start with, um, we have um, a special architecture within the assets because uh, we, there are two assets, Africa Centers of Excellence that uh, share the same uh, vision and mission. And that's the Africa Center of Excellence for Infectious Disease uh, at the University of Zambia and the other one at the Sokoine University of uh, Agriculture. All these share a common goal and a common mission and they are moderated on the scientific angle by the Joint International Scientific Advisory Board, but also they share a common uh, uh, regional uh, governing board. So we have been working together and we are coherent and we are looking forward to the next steps after the uh, asset to uh, program. And because of this synergy, uh, we have been able to be um, appointed as one of the 10 inaugural Oliver R. Tambo Africa Research Chair, uh, specifically on uh, viral epidemics. So the, um, the mission for the SACIT Foundation for One Health is, uh, uh, we understand that in Africa, the health and food security and livelihoods are miserable, uh, miserably improved through the mitigation of the impact of infectious diseases and antimicrobial resistance. And we have a vision that SACIDs will be recognized and respected as having unique world class expertise, facilities, and collaborations for vital One Health research. And so our mission is to undertake cutting edge uh, transdisciplinary multi sectoral research that focuses on impact on improving the livelihoods or on a community a One Health level uh, security. And this is delivered through strategic partnership. Uh, with both academia, research institutions, and uh, uh, international organizations. So pandemic challenge, uh, COVID-19 in Africa, uh, is similar to the other challenge that Africa has experienced. To cite a recent example, uh, the Ebola uh, virus uh, disease uh, in the continent. And so you look at uh, the social economic constraints that we have in Africa, the social ecological environment that we have, and the inadequate resources for response and elimination of these diseases. And that's why we have to come up with uh, innovations and in, uh, in order to address these uh, infectious disease burdens in, uh, uh, in Africa. So before COVID-19 struck, we just had our board meeting in uh, Livingstone in Zambia uh, for both the two assets in uh, at the University of Zambia and the Sokoine University of Agriculture. And we showed to the board that our own research uh, detected the attendance of genetic similarities between viruses in uh, Asia and the eastern flank of Africa, in the eastern African region. For example, serotype uh, 1 dengue virus, we showed that uh, there is genetic resemblance between the uh, viruses that were circulating in India, in Asia, and the ones in Tanzania or in the East African region. But also African swine fever you have had uh, originated in Madagascar in the eastern um, part of Africa, southern Africa, and then moved to the Caucasus region and uh, moved all the way to China, uh, which is the largest pork producer. Uh, PPR, Rumina, which is a virus of uh, sheep and goats, had the similar attendance. So we saw these signs of uh, movement, of um, uh, having similar viruses across regions. And we had started hearing about the, 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 the emergence of uh, COVID-19 in, uh, in China. And so Although this, um, we were warned of this potential and the risk posed by the novel coronaviruses in China, but uh, uh, we were geared towards um, addressing this from an academic angle, so student research, etc. And we didn't have a connection, for example, with the, the health group in the World Bank so that we can access uh, and interact with this group to see how we, we, we address uh, COVID-19. 
Uh, luckily enough, because of the trust that we have with our partners, especially ending pandemics, we were able within one week to interact with the SCORE Foundation, and we got uh, uh, funding for $4 million to mobilize and uh, pro provide expertise to the governments of Tanzania, uh, DRC, Zambia, and Mozambique uh, to prepare and uh, mount an initial response uh, to uh, COVID-19. So, um, in many ways, uh, COVID-19 has uh, changed uh, the way we behave. Uh, I've showed an example of a caricature that appeared in the monitor in Uganda on how uh, people, uh, even graduations are being handled uh, differently. But um, what I want to project in this slide is that uh, to be able to tackle uh, COVID-19 and our support that we got from SCOL, SACID member institutions in DRC, Mozambique, Zambia, and Tanzania, we focused at uh, four areas. One is surveillance. So, so we were focusing yeah, on- your slides have disappeared. Sorry. Okay. Slides maybe have I'll, um, let me share screen again. Sorry. I hope we were here. Yeah. Good. So we focused on four things. One is surveillance. Uh, so to ensure that um, we, we look at what is circulating in the communities and ensure uh, the com uh, co community one has uh, security and looked at the points of entry because the virus is, uh, was being introduced to countries through these ports of entry. Looked at the national capability for diagnosis of the disease. And uh, so we focused at the national public health labs in these countries. Uh, looked at uh, genomics to be able to analyze the um, genomes uh, and variants that are circulating in these countries and also to provide national uh, expertise uh, up to the level of the ministries of health or even uh, at the presidential level. I'll outline that in my acknowledgement letter. So we partnered also with the African uh, Union, uh, the African CDC, uh, to be able to provide training materials to community health workers on uh, COVID-19. But also we participated in Africa CDC expert teams and we supported the operationalization of uh, the Africa CDC frameworks on uh, event-based uh, uh, surveillance training. Uh, in addition to to the countries I mentioned, this we also provided the training to Uganda and uh, Cameroon. So although we have done many things on uh, COVID-19, my focus of this talk will be on uh, genomics, on how genomics can uh, has uh, the innovations in uh, tackling uh, COVID-19. So you are all aware of the global COVID-19 situation at the moment. The map looks like this at the moment. Uh, if you look at any map of infectious diseases, you'll see that the burden is too, uh, is central uh, in Africa. But uh, for some reason, uh, this has not been so for COVID-19. And we do have uh, somehow a clean sheet compared to the other countries. But uh, uh, more so, if you look at the statistics, more, most of the infections have been detected in Europe and the Americas, and Africa is uh, suffering only 2% of all the uh, infections that have been um, uh, reported to WHO. But uh, with all, more than 1.5 billion doses of vaccines being uh, administered, Africa still also has vaccinated very little of its proportion of its population. So that's to say, at some point, this disease, uh, all the map is going to be flipped. Uh, whereby the vaccination programs that are being rolled out elsewhere uh, in the other continents is going to subside uh, to overcome the virus. And there is a chance, high chance that um, there is going to be, uh, the disease is going to be endemic in uh, Africa. And when you have an immunocompromised population, that means the, it gives more chance for the, um, the emergence of new variants. And so this one is going to pose, a, um, I mean, a threat to global health security. So let me focus on uh, the virus itself. I think um, some of you may be aware that uh, all this mess around the globe is being caused by a very beautiful virus here, which has several proteins on its surface. You have the membrane protein, the spike protein, the envelope, and the nucleocapsid protein surrounding the messenger RNA or the RNA genome here. And most important, I want you to focus on this green uh, protein, which is called the spike, because the one that interacts with the, um, the, the host cells during entry. And although uh, it comprises just a, a simple piece in the genome, which is around 30,000 
a base pair, but it's very crucial because it's the, the gate for entry of the virus into the host cells. So the spike protein is the one which interacts with the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme type 2. And after receptor binding, you have a change in conformation of the spike protein uh, that triggers then uh, the fusion between the envelope of uh, the virus and the plasma membrane of the host cell as illustrated in this diagram. as a two uh, receptor on the host cell. And then this leads to a conformation or change in the spike protein, which pulls the spike, uh, the, angio, the host receptor towards the, um, the virus. And you have a fusion between the, the envelope of the virus and the plasma membrane of the host cell. So why am I giving, um, when, when, why am I stressing on these two conformation? You have two conformations of the spike protein. You have the pre-binding state in the virus and you have a post-fusion state. In the body, when you have the post-fusion state, this leads to um, least amount of neutralizing antibodies. If the body is presented with a closed uh, conformation, it elicits a lot of uh, neutralizing antibodies that leads to uh, clearance of the virus. So in some of the vaccines that have been manufactured, um, they have locked uh, the, the, the spike protein such that it does not transform into a post-fusion state so that it becomes uh, locked or closed all the time. And this triggers uh, a lot of neutralizing antibodies and improves the vaccine uh, efficacy against uh, um, the uh, COVID-19. So these are the two states where you have the closed conformation and the open conformation. So more neutralizing uh, antibodies and more stabilities towards uh, the closed conformation and mutating two amino acids in this, you produced a, a native uh, conformation of the, of the spike protein, which some vaccine have done, companies have done. And these are the com companies, that, uh, which, these are the vaccines that uh, have shown large uh, efficacy against the original virus, but also against the uh, variants. So why do we speak all of these mutations or, or of the spike protein? If you look in detail on the three dimensional structure of the spike protein, its size is about 2,723 amino acids. And so, for example, this is amino acid number 20, this is number 80, this is number 501. And you, you, you see this is the portion that's embedded in the envelope. This is the portion that is the, called the receptor binding domain, which interacts with the ACE2 receptor. And it's very crucial because if you have these mutations here uh, in the position N501, K417, and E484, uh, you have influence on the way that this virus interacts with the, uh, the, the host cell. So you have increased the transmissibility of the virus, increased the immune evasion, and you have increased severity of the disease. So let's focus, for example, at this position, um, 501 or number 80. Uh, how, do you, how do you get to know that these are the numbers which have, uh, uh, have risen to mutations or risen to uh, given rise to variants? You have several genome sequencing um, platforms, for example, the Ion Torrent, which is a laboratory-based uh, platform, the Illumina, et cetera. And these platforms have to sit in the lab. And they are very expensive to buy. One uh, iron torrent could cost you about $80,000. And there are machines that cost up to $200,000. But uh, this is not really ideal for Africa. So we asked ourselves for the question if genomics was either affordable or could be applied to uh, the limited resource settings. With these two platforms at the top here, you cannot be able to apply it in Africa. But there is a platform which is uh, based on Nanopore, which is uh, the mini iron and the MK uh, mini iron nanopore sequencing. These are small sequences. The size of uh, your phone that you are holding, all the USB stick that you uh, you know. And these are very cheap. For example, the mini iron is cost about $6,000, while the MK1C cost about $13,000. So these ones, uh, you could buy them, you can buy several of them. And the ease about it, you can also deploy it in, uh, you can deploy them in the field. Uh, so if you, you use this combined with uh, something called the Bento Labs on the left here, which is a mobile PCR machines uh, that can also do electrophoresis. So we went for this concept of having affordable genomics uh, in the continent of Africa. 
towards achieving a community level one has security. So if you want to make sure that the communities are safe from infectious diseases, we had developed this concept of, uh, you have to be able to deploy um, genomics up to the level of the field, uh, whereby you'll be able to conduct PCRs and next gen sequencing uh, in the field itself. And then of course, come to the lab and validate. And number two, deploy mobile uh, phone uh, applications that are able to capture these diseases so that you can know when outbreaks occur. And then develop uh, diagnostics that are based on um, uh, very, uh, not really human antibodies, but chemo antibodies, which are called nanobodies, so that you could be able to conduct the preliminary diagnosis uh, of these infectious diseases uh, at site. And so we have trained our students on how to do this, on to how to do this in the field. And uh, we have procured several of these uh, uh, mini and sequences. And also we have uh, procured a four by four car, which is equipped at the, at the rear here with um, a mini lab that uh, contains ref uh, power outlets, uh, refrigerators, uh, freezers, and a bench in which you can, uh, after inactivation of the viruses, you could be doing the sequencing, uh, whether in the car or in uh, on the side of the car. So we have created the so-called uh, mobile genomics lab at SASITS that is easy to deploy anywhere in the field and conduct field uh, sequencing and diagnosis. So what do these uh, gadgets do, uh, the mini iron? What they will do, the, you do pair um, amplification of the genome. And then after you do that, uh, you are able to create a, a complete genome of about uh, 30,000 uh, base pairs for, for COVID. And then you're going to look at um, the relatedness of these uh, viruses and then detect whether some mutations in this uh, are similar to the so-called uh, uh, variants or their imaging uh, variants. How do you do that? Uh, the virus, I said, for example, the spike protein is made up of uh, 2,723 letters. This one, TSP, VD, et cetera. If you look at number one here is the virus, original virus that was detected in Wuhan. And then from virus number two up to number 17, this is what we collected from the uh, Tanzanian samples. And so you you see that in the top picture here, uh, there is no change whatsoever in the amino acids from the top to the bottom. So the conclusion is that uh, the, the viruses that were circulating in Tanzania in this region at this time were similar to the virus that is uh, caused the original uh, coronavirus disease in China. But if you look in the second picture here, you have the Chinese, uh, the, the, the Wuhan virus at the top, but then at some point, for example, this point here, the Wuhan virus is having a D, but the viruses in Tanzania have an A. So, and this is position number 80. Eh? So that means the mutation will be called D80. Uh, a. And so as you accumulate these mutations and you count these mutations, they lead to the designation of uh, uh, the variants. And this is an example of it. If you look at the complete genome of uh, COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-2 from zero to 29,000 uh, letters, uh, you have these mutations in the RNA-dependent polymerase. For example, this mutation E changed to D at position 5,064. And the spike plot in here uh, has been expanded because most of the mutations that are accumulated are present in the spike uh, uh, region. And this is because it's the protein that interacts with the host receptor. And this is one what uh, makes uh, contributes to virus evolution and virus uh, fitness. And most of these mutations are accumulated uh, when the virus is passaged in immunocompromised po population. Uh, for example, um, in immunosuppressed uh, individuals treated with uh, medicine for a long uh, time or in uh, patients with cancer or patients with uh, HIV. And for example, the, the so-called B117 is the UK variant and now it's called the alpha variant, has this mutation indicated in orange, this one. So the sum of this mutation uh, make the whole so-called UK variant. The Brazilian uh, uh, variant, the UK variant here in, uh, in purple, and some of these share common mutations at position number 501, N501Y, the E484K, et cetera. 
So if you, you want to keep a close watch at these mutations as they evolve uh, in the viruses that are circulating the communities, you have to do complete genome sequencing so that you, you, you are able to discover new variants that are circulating or previously described uh, variants that are circulating in the community. And it's very important in vaccine selection because some of these uh, variants escape a neutralization by some of the vaccines, especially those vaccines that do have the background Wuhan uh, virus, but do not have the locked type S of the spike protein. So in the vaccine, what they do, they either deliver you with DNA, uh, RNA that is carrying the messenger to message to make the spike, or they give you the whole virus, which is inactivated, or they uh, just purify uh, a recombinant uh, spike protein. Uh, so, so far, the platforms that have been used to, uh, to make uh, the vaccines, sorry for, for citing only inactivated vaccines, it should be the platforms for making the COVID-19 vaccines. So you have the so-called inactivated vaccines, whereby uh, the virus is produced in cell catchers, mainly in African green monkey cells, the virus cells, uh, and then the viruses are purified and then inactivated by chemicals. Examples of vaccines that have been made by this way is the Sinopharm and Sinovac uh, uh, vaccines, all from China. Alternatively, um, the information to make the spike protein is put in a baculovirus vector and then expressed in most cells, these Spodoptera frugipeda insect cells, or the so-called SF9 cells. And so you produce a lot of um, a recombinant spike protein, which is then purified and injected into our bodies as a vaccine to trigger an immune response. An example of such vaccine is the Novavax vaccine. The other way is to have to use an adenovirus vector, which has the spike protein information, which then is grown in cell culture to produce those spike protein. And then you have uh, millions of uh, these uh, uh, viruses that are injected into our body, and then they trigger an immune response to the adenovirus vector itself, uh, but also to uh, the um, to the spike protein of the 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 SARS-CoV-2 virus. So this. The vaccines that have made use the, the, this platform is the AstraZeneca, Johnson and Johnson and Sputnik. The choice of the vectors in this adenovirus vector that is less uh, circulating in, in the communities. For example, they've chosen adenovirus 26, the chimpanzee um, uh, adenovirus and, and adenovirus number five, because these are least prevalent in Europe. So it's our work in Africa to check whether we do have low or high prevalence of these adenoviruses, because if they are highly prevalent in the communities, then it will reduce the efficiency of these vaccines. The last one, which is most contested, is the messenger RNA vaccines, which do deliver the messenger RNA directly into our bodies and then our ribosome to take uh, that information and make those proteins. And uh, Moderna and Pfizer uh, have made these vaccines. And this, uh, it takes only a few weeks to develop these vaccines. And you can easily adapt them to new variants that are emerging elsewhere, because you just need to synthesize that information uh, all that those nucleotides and form that uh, uh, message in you, pack that message in your uh, messenger RNA. So far, the, um, the safest vaccines that have been made showing uh, very few adverse events. But the problem in the African settings, especially with Pfizer vaccines, that uh, it requires a storage at minus eight, and we do have very few ultra cold storage facilities. And Moderna uh, at least requires minus 20. And most of the vaccination programs in our countries for children do have uh, the minus 20 uh, facilities. Um, Modeling of the neutralization uh, studies have started uh, to come up, the imaging and the efficiency of the different vaccines is coming up. For example, this is convalescent and centla, uh, following natural infection. This is uh, the amount of neutralizing antibodies following vaccination with CoronaVac. This one is Janssen, this is AstraZeneca, this one is Sputnik, this is uh, Pfizer, this is Novavax, and this one here is um, Moderna. So you see the messenger RNA and the recombinant uh, protein uh, vaccines are far more ahead compared to inactivated viruses and uh, adenovirus uh, uh, vectors. And these vaccines at the top here, they do have also efficiency to neutralize these uh, variants, of, variants of concern, which are now not named according to their countries, but they are 
named alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. So this is my last slide. What I was wanted to show that uh, you could use fit for purpose genomics in the settings of Africa to be able to understand the, the, uh, the variants that are circulating in the countries. And this will be very appropriate in choosing the appropriate vaccines for administration in the African settings. Of course, vaccines are very expensive, but there is a window from COVAX, which is uh, uh, giving an opportunity for vaccination, vaccinating 20% of the um, African populations and then could be accessed uh, for free. And uh, countries need to pay only for, uh, for, for, for logistics. But uh, vaccine supplies are very low in the globe at the moment. And I think America and Europe has to vaccinate fully first before Africa accesses fully these uh, vaccines. And this calls for an initiative now as a game changer that um, investment in vaccine manufacturing has to be accelerated uh, uh, in Africa. So this is my acknowledgement slide. This is uh, our open access uh, article that we produced together with our colleagues in Zambia, uh, Mozambique, uh, DRC and Tanzania. Uh, this is the um, prime minister of Tanzania um, visiting our mobile uh, genomics uh, laboratory. And at the top here now, uh, I've been serving in uh, the president's COVID-19 uh, special advisory committee. Committee. So at SACIDS, we are very uh, uh, pleased for this uh, nomination. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Good science. Thank you very much, Ms. Inzo, for a very good presentation. Uh, I'm impressed by the fact that you are on top of the, the show with, with, as far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned. So again, we shall have questions from uh, colleagues from other centers. And now I, I want you to rest a bit and then invite the Create to come in with the research and innovation from incubation centers. So uh, Professor Wood, if you're around, please uh, share your screen and let's go on. Professor Wood, are you around? Yeah, thank you very much, go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, am I audible now? You are audible and we can see your screen. Go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to take you through my experience with the Data Driven Innovation Information Center, which is housed within a creates. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Uh, we have got vision and mission, but I'm not going to go through all that. I'm just going through the slogan, which is technology and innovation towards taking the region to national level. Next. So what are the challenges? I, I want to start with challenges first, and then I'll go through what we've done and uh, what we've achieved, what, what we have to show so far. So let me go through challenges. So challenges is that in Africa universities, uh, especially the case of Tanzania, we do a lot of innovation, especially here in Nelson Mandela, which is a research intensive university. Uh, all our students who come, uh, but, but, uh, please yes, stay on there. Uh, most of our students, when they come here, we, we encourage them to do demand-driven research. They don't do research for the sake of research, but research which is, is, is uh, relevant to industry or communities. But when they do those kind of research, you, you find that the private sector is not well connected with the university. So you can do your research, but at the end of the day, uh, the, 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 the industrial sector, the private sector, is not even aware of what you are doing. So we end up with a dead valley where your product is not uh, uh, incubated or, or taken into commercialization. So this has been happening to almost all our universities here and there's hardly any product from a university in Tanzania, which is sad because uh, I'm sure a lot of industry are still in the test tubes, are still in the, in the laptops, they're just waiting to be commercialized which is uh, sometimes too late. Next. So what we need to do is 
to bring the, 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 the uh, industry closer to the, to the investors. So it's for the investors to know what we are doing, okay. investors to know what we are doing, okay, again. So when university know, knows what we are doing in the, I mean, when the industry knows what we are doing and the university are doing what the industry wants them to do, you find uh, uh, commercialization will be very, very easy in commission. So once you, are, you, you do a research, there's someone out there in the industry who is waiting for the results or in the community. So that's the, the, uh, the optimal uh, situation, that, that, that's really realistic. But it's so difficult to achieve that uh, there is uh, atmosphere or social because we don't have don't, that many industries in Tanzania, as you all, all know. So uh, that unique opportunity is what we are striving for. So you, you get to see and go along, next one. For example, I'm just giving an example of Korea here. Why Korea? Korea, uh, on year, year 2020, Korea and Tanzania were on the same level economically at the same level. But uh, now Korea is actually uh, giving Tanzania loans. Korea is a developed country. Korea has got so many products, gadgets. Uh, but when you look at the private sector, they contribute 71.8% to, 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 to research and innovation. Why in Tanzania you find that the private sector only contributed 0 0.08. Uh, what I'm going to say here is that uh, most of the research is being funded by private sector or industries. Uh, when you look at, uh, otherwise in Tanzania, you see that the, from outside is for the 2%. And when you are funded by outside the uh, organization, those kind of funding, mostly you're doing someone else's agenda, it's not your agenda. So you end up doing research uh, where Welcome Foundation is interested in, or Bill's getting is interested in, but not, not, not someone in Africa. But when you look at the case of Korea, it's very little uh, coming from outside, 0 0.222. So th that's what we part. But also, also I want to add that uh, Korea spent 4% of the GDP in, in, in uh, innovation in uh, R&D while we spend 0.4% in R&D. So if you, Korea is spending 10 times R and, uh, G, of, 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 their, of their GDP and you are spending 0.4, of course, they will be, be very much ahead. So also, if the amount of our government, the, the money that our government are pumping into uh, R&D, that's where the problem is as well. Next one. So what, what progress have we done so far? Uh, so far, we don't have a problem with innovation in Mandela. We've got so many products we've innovated, but most of them, if, if not all of them have not been incubated, quite a few, and uh, it's only now that we are, we are working on incubation, incubating them. Uh, so we have uh, recruited six incubators, and we are taking them through various uh, trainings, including business culture, work-life balance, leadership, uh, value proposition, and, and many other, uh, other aspects. And we we'll also attach them to mentors. So they're being mentored, uh, hoping that that will, will, will guide them into uh, be able to implement their product and finally commercialize their products. Next one. So those are the products we'll come up with. Uh, all these products have won national and international awards uh, from Grand Challenge to, to, to Maxat, which is the Tanzanian uh, uh, country award, uh, award, awarding uh, organization. Uh, for example, we've got a biopet site, which is as, as good as a synthetic biopet site, but because it's a bio, you can spray in the morning and then in the afternoon the product is ready. To be to be to be uh, eaten by human being. Things like fish feed. We get so many so much so many types of fish feeds which are not up to standards. But uh, the one we will come up here with Mandela. Is someone's PhD, so is one who is, is, has everything 
needed for a fish to be like a fish in the wild. So the, those kind of, of uh, innovation are, are very exciting indeed. Of course, we've got also Omega 3 DHA, which is developed uh, brain for children or mother who are pregnant. So those children who were who were, were impaired mentally, we used the Omega 3 DHA and we could see the difference within weeks. So that those are the products we have. Next, those also are the products we have. Uh, I don't need to go through that, but those are products we have. As I said, products is uh, innovation is not a problem. Is here you know, problem is uh, innovation and the commercialization. Next, yeah. Also, we work together with the University of Dar es Salaam. We came up with uh, and COVID uh, two type of and COVID which which are working very well, and we are together forming a, a herbarium. Uh, with the University of Dar es Salaam, where we are going to collect all the uh, medicinal plants in the country and, uh, and be able to. It seems we have lost the uh, creates. Are you there? Your screen has disappeared. And you are you are you are no longer audio. Uh, the, the the audio is also. Yeah, we're working on it. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, this it was a, a COVID uh, innovations on COVID with the best of the Islam, which are actually working in a lot of people are buying them. Uh, although, uh, as um, I'm saying, uh, they're not even arrived yet. So uh, we realized that uh, by selling products into a bottle or a tin is not exciting to, to innovators. So instead, we are coming up with a small scale industry, prototype industries, whereby someone can see the whole production line and it's easier for, to convince an investor when the production line is alive. So they can see from the uh, raw material up to the end of the, the, the product. So we we have got already two two of them. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, that's the inside of the, uh, a bottle or a tin of something. Actually, UNDP came and saw our this um, uh, main industry, and they were very excited. I'm, I'm going to explain later on what we are doing together with them. Uh, which came through the, the, these green industries because it's a new concept in the country and uh, they are quite excited. Next one, next one. Yeah. Also, before I get to NDP, uh, we're also doing a lot of demo, demo, demo uh, demonstration, demo plots, uh, involving the community, teaching them how, for example, to use the bio pet sites and uh, showing experiment, experiment with with size and with and with aesthetic and without and in, in all, all cases our hours were, were uh, performed much much better than, than, the, than the rest and uh, actually this was all on a nane nane celebration which is a country celebration so we even won uh, a cup for that so next one uh, we are also another thing we are doing is we're, we're establishing an agriculture science demonstration unit, which will be a screen house and uh, a fish pond as well. The fish pond will help us to, to, to test our, our, our fish feeds as well as uh, people doing the, uh, fish research and also uh, uh, sell the fingerlings and I mean, for you the fingerlings and sell them. 
and also students will be able to demonstrate their products. We can also uh, invite the community to come and learn uh, new techniques, new ways of doing things. We can also use this as a technology transfer, uh, invite different uh, investors to see what, 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 is, uh, what is new. Also, there are some uh, produce which uh, are almost extinct. We want to bring them back and plant them in, in this uh, greenhouse and uh, with the botanical garden as well, so that people can, for example, uh, beans and uh, blah, 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 is much potent. It is, it is more, more, more proteins or, or more, more active ingredients than beans. But blah, blah, blah was used when I was a, a young girl, but now nobody's using it. So we want to bring it back and, and, and convince, the, peop, uh, convince the, the, the community that these products are potent and that uh, actually better than, 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 than beans or uh, other preferred things. So we're we are, we are, we are going back to that indigenous foods and promote them through this uh, uh, the science demonstration unit. Uh, here we were in Naninani in, 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 in Simiu showing case our, our products uh, and also we Maxat and in all this we won a, uh, a trophy Actually, our, our students, they both, they both won trophies and, and it's from five, uh, thousand, five million uh, Tanzanian shillings. So it means what we are doing is, is, is actually uh, recognized here by, the, by the whole of Tanzania. So some tangible achievements so far. Uh, one of the most tangible uh, results we've come up with was when UNDP came here, they told us they've got a program of lab acceleration uh, program, which They've got 91 already in 91 countries, and they wanted to have one in Tanzania. But they were going around looking for, for investing in Tanzania, which is relevant or which can understand what is lab acceleration. And when they came to us here in creates, we realized that we, we are actually thinking on the same uh, wavelength. So now we've signed an MOU with them. They came here, we did a joint plan, we did a term of a reference for a consultant who will come. Uh, to, 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 uh, to consult with our, our innovation sec our innovation and in, uh, commercialization center here. And of, we officially launched the partnership. So this is very exciting indeed because UNP means that all other UN agencies are, are, will be part of us and the access to, to industries, good access to, to big funders. And the promise that the, us that uh, will uh, mobilize funds together. Uh, also, they're interested in, in, uh, in data uh, and to, to accelerate whatever we're doing together. So th this was uh, well, it's just a few months, in, a month ago, so it's quite recent and we're looking forward for the official launching of the partnership. Uh, next one. Uh, and, and I'm happy to say that through all that effort also we go, we got the Oliver Tambo Chair Initiative on Nanotechnology. Uh, and as you're aware in Africa or at the Tanzania site, we've got a lot of, a lot of medicinal plants. People will tell you a, a certain tribe can, can uh, heal malaria, they've got something to heal malaria, certain tribe can heal cancer, they've got uh, anti-cancer uh, treatment. But where are they? Even though they are they're in black bags or somewhere on, on, on the market on the floor. So we want to drive science in, in disabled products and use the nano medicine or nano technology, which is the latest science in, in making up, coming up with medication. So we are, we are going to, to, to uh, build a platform on nanotechnology for medicinal plants. Uh, we start with malaria because that's our, 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 our main. Uh, challenge in Africa, but it will go into other, other, other parts as well. But also we're going to use nanotechnology for efficacy, it will be improved efficacy for fertilizer, biofertilizer as well. The good thing is the project is for 15 years, they give you one million on the first year, on the first five years, and if you do well, the, the project can go on for 15 years. And the money they give us, they call it seed money, so we are supposed and they, are, they will also do the same, uh, get out there and, and, and try and raise more funds. So that, that's very exciting that within 15 years, we believe we come up with anti-malaria drugs like it's a missing, 
is a Chinese uh, herbal extract. But Artemisinin now is the most, or the most efficacy leading anti malaria drug in, in, in the world and came from, from a herbal plant in, in China. So why not in Tanzania? So we're, we're very excited on that, that we think we will be able to do something uh, out of this funding. Next one. Uh, okay, when we got this project, uh, the problem was that there was no policy or system for information and commercialization here in the university. So we had, we had to develop one. So th that took us almost a year because of the bureaucracy. This is a government university, so nothing goes quick. Everything is, has got to go through a lot of protocols. But now we've been able to establish an IP center. We've been able to, uh, to, uh, the to, to send it an disclosure. There's a P committee, and we are now actually uh, registering the, 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 the intellectual property. They've been able to write the proposal, business proposal already. So we had to facilitate this so that we can move forward because the one in existence here in Nelson Mandela. So next one. Uh, challenges so far, that's the last one. Challenge, the serious challenges in procurement process. As you know, a, a government institution Procurement is, is another, another ball game. It took us almost six to eight months just to, to, to build a, a small container with any factories we saw them. The building took two weeks, but the procedure took six months. So you can imagine that. Uh, so also it is very bureaucratic patenting these products, registering them in line, we just take the time, but we were working on it. And uh, as I said earlier on, the little interaction interaction between industry and university or investors for that matter uh, is hampering is is uh, is, um, is not very healthy. We just hope with the UNP coming on board, we'll be able to, 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 to overcome that. I think that's my last slide. Um, I think I'm done. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Huda and the, and the team for the good work you're doing at Nelson Mandela. Uh, now the floor is open for questions and answers. Uh, I invite uh, people to, to, to ask a question to anyone or any one of the five presenters so far. We had a presentation from uh, Aquafish, Sesam, Sassids, and now Create. Thereafter, we shall receive a presentation from a student. So you are most welcome. And the, I want also to ask presenters to quickly go through the chat. There might be questions that you may pick and summarize as we respond to verbal questions. Now, the first question is coming from uh, Bale, Professor Bale from uh, Copper Belt. Uh, Professor, can you ask your question, please? Yeah, thanks very much indeed. Uh, uh, I have uh, two questions. The first one goes to the last presenter. Um, she talked of the, the bureaucracy in, in protecting the products, either through patent, copyright, and so forth. Where is this bureaucracy uh, emanating from? Is it from their side D or is it from their patenting office? That's the first question. Uh, the second question goes to the uh, commercialization of research, that is the CISM. SESAM uh, Center. Uh, they did a very, they, they are doing a very good job. Uh, they have got a lot of uh, research outputs in terms of the uh, foods and stuff and so forth. Now, uh, it's not a question as such. Can they share with us just briefly how they have protected those food stuffs? We saw the those like the jam and so forth. Uh, how do they they protect them, especially in terms of uh, the process? Uh, because uh, uh, protecting a, a products, uh, whatever product you have, either through patent, copyright, and so forth, is a process which is a bit cumbersome. But how do they manage within a short period of time? Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, we're going to take another question. Quest, other questions from uh, Professor Mark uh, Remam. Uh, 
Professor Mark from London or wherever you are. Uh, Mark from Sassids. Yeah. Uh, I've got um, um, a question and observation. Uh, my question is to um, uh, the good work from Malawi, the international accreditation. Uh, I think we, we owe them um, uh, a good round of clapping and to uh, congratulate them. Um, but I have to say, I was not surprised when I first heard about that because um, the, the meeting which we held in um, uh, Lilongwe, we in Malawi, we had the opportunity of visiting uh, the center. Um, and it was quite impressive to see uh, the agriculture work when uh, what we saw uh, and the relationship they've had with um, with Japan for uh, about 10 years. Um, now, my question is um, what they described is their PhD program coursework based or research based? Uh, and whether there'll be a difference of approach for uh, research based uh, projects. My, my comment, and that is probably not for answering now, but certainly a um, uh, point that uh, Professor Misinzo raised. Here we we are thanks to the work which is supporting uh, research with, uh, with students. It primed us to uh, for an issue now. But when, when this problem came up, we could not respond with whatever expertise we have based simply on the relationship that we have with the, with the, with the um, World Bank and, uh, and the Center of Excellence. Now, it did remind us of what happened uh, in, um, in West Africa before that. And we are talking about these things, not just simply a matter of good health, that social disruptors, social economic disruptors, as we've seen. So as we move um, forward in this post uh, COVID era, and there are other, other areas and, and climate change and so on. And the centers are beginning to mature. And as we are seeing all the presentations are really, really, really good. How do we become members of the club such that through our unique membership, we're able to interact with the development side of the bank? You know, for example, in our, in our case, we have no contact with the, uh, those who deal with the pandemics, those who, who deal with uh, the health system. They are pulling out lots and lots of, of millions, but nothing is going into, in, into this, you know, climate change is going to come up, big, 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 big issues of development. How are these centers going to be able to link to if what they do, particularly the PhD and, uh, and above level, which will be the uni start doing high quality science and where you got expertise, but when the nations want them, we we only we can only play with the words. In this case, we we, we were happy, we we are lucky with um, had um, a partnership, but that kind of partnership we, which we had does not qualify for um, uh, for uh, DLR. Um, so. That you know, some kind of reflections, um, um, not necessarily now, but if I could plant it uh, uh, to, uh, to your um, uh, innovative thinking. Uh, and really, um, the machines are showed them up. Let us be under no illusion. Every government in the world has got its primary responsibility to its nationals. So when the North is affected by the same plight as the South, we will come last in the year. So we really know where the value of these centers of excellence, um, well, I don't know when you con it was conceived whether this was thought through, but this really, this, this is now an opportunity in the post, post COVID era, that these uh, centers of excellence, it, it doesn't matter in what area, because if it's not climate change, if it's not pandemic, it'll be, you know, be some, something else. 
we do need to um, uh, to see to what extent uh, they can have some connection with the development side of um, COVID because the that expertise that you know when 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 the crisis is there that has come from within. And particularly if it's a global one, the like climate change like we just seen pandemic. If it's a global. Uh, you got to have you got to have expertise in, in C2. We cannot afford to have what happened in West Africa again, nine months before anybody turned up. We didn't take, we didn't have the right to only pick it up anyway, we're working on that. But it was the nine, 12 months, eight, 11 months before the international community turned up. Now, when they're also affected, it's a, it's, in, it's a matter of necessity. They can't look at you, your, your problem when they're also facing the same problems. So we really need, there needs to be some post-COVID thinking uh, that uh, we don't lose this opportunity of um, developing these, these centers to be the centers of um, excellence and expertise that will be there when needed. Thank you, Professor Mark uh, Ramam. Uh, this, this is a very good question. And uh, it, it was not directed to, to, to Gerard himself, but actually it is for all of us to consider. Now I, I will invite Judy from uh, Akalise to ask his question, then I'll follow up with the salary from the World Bank. So Judy, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, in a special way, I want to, to thank uh, uh, the team for having organized this exchange, this sharing. I think it has assisted us a lot to appreciate the process of international accreditation. So our appreciation to you, uh, Jonathan and your team, I think this was very, very good. Now, um, I wanted to make just two questions to, to Luana, but I need to begin to thank them. They, they gave a very wonderful presentation but also uh, I want to congratulate them upon the success they have managed to achieve. And I think we've managed to learn a lot from them. We now realize that it is really possible. Now, the questions are, one, um, how much in terms of money did they on this process? Does their accreditor also accredit other disciplines or put differently? Which other disciplines do they accredit uh, apart from uh, fish related disciplines? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Judy. Uh, now I go to Saori, the last person to oh. ask questions today. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you everyone for the great presentation. Um, I have a question um, to Sasan. Um, I saw like a lot of entrepreneurs coming up from the um, incubation center uh, and the, I mean, also the, um, the center itself. And I'm wondering that the, how do you support for the scaling up or um, yeah, really commercializing the, uh, the product? Um, I, I think you do have a seed money but then do you also have like extra funding or do you connect with the um, external incubators um, so that they may be able to help more? Um, or when you also collaborate with the private sector, um, what kind of route do you go? It's usually like the private sector may take the product and move forward and then they pay you for something or um, you also encourage for the maybe joint venture or yeah, I wanted to see like after the, um, the initial stage of the um, commercialization takes place in the university, like how, what kind of a route you usually take or um, whether you need the support in, in this area. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sauri. Uh, uh, now I, I invite the uh, presenter to, to, to make the uh, response and we will start with the Professor Bale's question, which were directed to create uh, the social bureaucracy and say some uh, how they are protecting it. it somebody was worried about intellectual property rights. So, so please let's start with the creative. Professor Wuda to respond to the question, and then I'll ask you, George, to also respond for balanced questions. Yeah. So, so the lens is actually due to 
Mandela being a new university, you're only 10 years old, and there was no system for patenting, or there was no IP office, there was no policy. Uh, so after getting the incubation center, everything had to start from first. So a lot of uh, time is wasted here in Nelson Mandela while uh, people are, are trying to come up with the uh, actual documents, uh, the contracts, and uh, then the post going out there. So it's just because we are the first one to go through the, this process. So I, I believe people who are going to come after us won't go through the same length we are going to, through. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I, Georgie, are you there? Can you respond to the Bale's question? Uh, he was interested to know how IPR has a project. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jonathan. I want you to see that. Can you see that document? Yes, uh, Universal Intellectual Property Right Policy. Yes. Uh, I mentioned, I showed that just to show you that the first thing we do before we do joint ventures with the companies as we roll out the products for commercialization is to use this as a bench, a framework for, for, for working with them. And um, I just want, if you allow me to answer also Sauri's question in the same framework, is that we do contracts with the companies and based on our IPR policy, which we share and has to be the basis of the contract. But also once you do a joint venture, it also protects you. Most companies do it like a product now is a joint product, the same way the joint venture is. And that has worked for the seed company, the one I was talking about, Fida Seed. That's the one we have succeeded to do. Uh, the food-based ones, we have not actually gotten a company which will pick it, it is in the process. Uh, in terms of uh, engineering fabrications, there is just one, there's a company called International, I mean, uh, Kenya Industrial and Research Development uh, Institute. Institute, which uh, protects you by giving you certification of the machinery, but that does not protect you so much. So one other thing we are trying to do is also to work with uh, companies outside. I want just to thank Sauri for connecting us to Japan companies. We are already work in talking terms with one company called EMCO, which is on agricultural area. And we believe this will be able to help us improve even on our IPR for protection purposes. But I want to mention as I close, I finish this, that it is not that easy. You have really to keep on learning. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Professor Mark Raymamu had two questions. The first question went to Aquafish. He wanted to know the difference between uh, uh, to know whether the, the program accredited were were short, for short cause for uh, they were cause based or research based, and whether the process is the same. I think I got it that way. So Kasam and the and the, and the director for quality assurance, you are, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. I think I'll take up that one since it's not more technical for my director. Uh, uh, on that question, I think he, all we can say is the hours is cost-based, the PhD is cost-based, and the, we may not uh, be in a position to know how ACAS uh, goes about when it is research-based unless you present the program to them, which is research-based, then maybe they can advise how they do the accreditation process. So ours was the cost-based. I don't know whether I should just tackle the other two questions from- Yes, from, from Judy, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so from Judy, as you saw from the presentation, I think the money uh, we had to pay for the two programs directed to ACAS was, uh, was about 46,000 euros. Uh, that's the 70% you pay first uh, upon the contract and the 30% uh, after final decision. Uh, but of course, obviously, for you to put up a small team to work internally, definitely you incur some costs because the team may need to go somewhere and camp and do the documentation. 
Uh, so you, 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 you have just to add a, a little bit of the internal costs which you have to support your internal team to do this. But in overall, I think the gains are more than this kind of expenditure, if you look at it holistically. Uh, in terms of the disciplines which ACAS accredits, ACAS actually accredits every other discipline. Uh, their philosophy is once you submit your programs, they are the ones who are going to look for experts who are fit in that field. And these are the guys who, are, who will be doing the reporting to ACAS commission, which makes decision in the end. So they can mobilize experts from any other field, depending on what field you have presented to them. Uh, I think that is all that we had as the aquafish. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Kasam, for responding to the questions. Uh, there was a, a challenge that was posed by Professor Mark Ruyamam, and uh, I want to invite uh, Roberta, if you have a, a word or two, about how to, he, he was actually emphasizing on the way uh, innovation from centers uh, dealing with the public health issues may be taken up by organizations like the World Bank or WHO in a way that would benefit not only Africa, but also the rest of the world. So if you have a comment, Roberta, and if you're available, please. Can I just put a qualifier? It, yeah. It's not just we developed it here and then in five years time it will be available in, uh, in um, Indonesia or so. That, that, that would be excellent. Yeah. But in the midst of fire, in this case, this, this COVID fire, we couldn't turn to anybody in the, in the World Bank who is involved in these development issues because they're, they're also putting out money for, uh, for response to uh, uh, epidemics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, you know the, the system is a maintenance aspect. We might maybe you know, do, do something which would be available for years, but right now, the whole world is going to think, and, and Africa is on its own. So yeah. how do we, you know, how, how do we get access to the development side of the of the bank, and how do you people market us as having the expertise in situ in Africa, so that it doesn't always have to depend on bringing teams from outside? We saw what happened with Ebola in West Africa. It was dependent on bringing a lot of expertise from outside. 11,000 unnecessary deaths nine months before uh, there was anything actually uh, proper of, um, of substance in West Africa. And, and when, at that time, there was no problem in, in, uh, in, a, the, in the first world. In this case, when it's a problem in the first world, we, we got COVID now, we don't know what to manage tomorrow. So really, you have to, to have expertise in situ you have some mechanism of being able to facilitate that expertise in situ beyond just simply issuing degrees. Yes, Roberta, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thanks, Jonathan. I think this is a multi-pronged uh, situation and, and response that's needed because the bank is very different from, say, the World Health Organization or from UNESCO or a UN agency in that when we operate, we operate as partners to ministries of finance and line ministries like Ministry of Education. So as we responded to COVID, as the bank responded to COVID, we responded directly with ministries of finance, ministries of health, ministries of education. And on those levels of negotiation, we absolutely said you should access your centers of, of excellence. We know of, of those who are doing interventions specific around COVID. We thankfully, because of all of you, had a very open dialogue around the COVID. And this is just one area I know of innovation that we're talking about, but it's a pertinent one today. Um, but because we started having these conversations around your COVID responses, we were able to give them very specific information about what was happening in terms of you know, sanitation, um, making hand sanitizer, some of the innovations you all were doing with 3D printing, with training of medical technicians, we were able to share this information. The, the challenge on our side uh, from, just from the bank side is that that is where our intervention exists. It exists as sort of po policy dialogue supporters uh, and facilitators. We don't send people in to the country in response to COVID unless there's a huge project that's been agreed with the government and they've asked for bank staff to come in. 
the World Health Organization sends in teams of doctors. That's a different agency and something that you know the bank doesn't play a role in. But we also saw, and many of you will have experienced this, a very strong politicization of the COVID response as well. And when that happened, it made it harder to say, you should look to these centers, they're doing great things. When the conversation coming back at us was, well, COVID's not a really big issue for us right now. And so you know, there was just a, a, a dialogue mismatch on what we saw as something really important happening and what we were getting back as a, this is not a really big issue for us. And that was happening across the continent. So it was a very challenging time. And then in another realm, which is what we're doing through PASSET and we're doing it with some of Sauri's initiatives, we're really trying to promote innovation and competitiveness, not just so that your centers are being seen as driving these things, but also so that there's more of a culture of innovation that can be part of our conversations and ongoing dialogue around how to support research and research validity in all of your countries. And so, you know, there's a, it's a multi-level initiative and we're working on it at, in stages, but what you're doing now and all of these dialogues that you've been having the last couple of days uh, with the Japanese firms that are supporting commercialization, that gives us more evidence on how impactful the work you're doing can be. And that allows us to then drive the next level of dialogue with, the, with your government line ministries to say, this is something you really need to focus more and more on. So we work in concert with all of you to give us the evidence to do that. Super, thank you very much, Robert. I think that, that was a very good response. Um, now let me close this uh, presentation session. And if you have more questions, I think it's, it's important that you continue with the conversation directly with the presenters. I'm sure there's a lot to, to learn from each other. Now, I, I invite a student from Wakofish, if she's there, to make her presentation. And the, I also hope that the uh, techno policy is available for their presentation. So Wakofish student, please come quickly, explain your, your research topic what were the objective, how do you, you did it, and the, what are the results that we can uh, be proud of? Francis Jiva, you are, you are welcome. Share your screen and uh, start your presentation. All right, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. We can hear you and you've seen your, your screen. All right, thank you so much. So uh, my name is Francis Jiva, uh, 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 the student who has finished uh, his master's degree from Luana Aquafish. And uh, my thesis topic was uh, consumer preference for uh, culture therapy, which is a study that was conducted in the capital of Malawi, which is Lilongwe. As a matter of introduction, uh, therapy, which is locally known as jambo, which is a premium fish uh, for Malawi, uh, has been on the decrease for ages now. And uh, this has been to, due to uh, uh, population growth uh, and also overfishing. And there have been several efforts to try to increase production, several strategic papers by the government. And specifically to mention, uh, the efforts have been centering around uh, aquaculture and pond aquaculture for that matter. But there have been challenges in trying to increase production uh, from uh, pond aquaculture due to uh, climate change and also uh, poor feed conversion rate. Uh, so literature and several researchers have uh, 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 advised that product uh, is the increase in production or the demand for the so uh, the, the mentioned fish, which is tilapia, can be uh, made by uh, cage culture, and uh, this has been touted by the Malawi government. And uh, also, one thing to mention is that one uh, commercial company which is called Madeco, and is also a private sector partner in the aquafish, has, be, has, the one, has been the one uh, that piloted uh, the production of tilapia in, uh, uh, in cages. However, the production from this, uh, these cages, uh, the harvest has been different from the tilapia or jambo, which is produced from the wild sources. Uh, those are lakes or uh, rivers. Uh, the differences have been several, but the noticeable ones, the, the noticeable one is uh, the difference in terms of uh, the look. The natural one looks uh, white grayish, while uh, the ones produced in the cages 
uh, looks very black, as you can see in the shared screen. The first one is the one that is produced in the cages, uh, while the second one uh, is caught from the world, uh, world sources. Uh, so really there's been uh, no research that has been conducted to solicit preferences from consumers on what they look for uh, when it comes to selection of uh, 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 or purchasing of therapia. And this study therefore uh, aims at uh, 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 soliciting important attributes that consumers uh, consider when purchasing therapia and also trying to assess uh, the socioeconomic factors that uh, affect selection of uh, specific attributes uh, for the therapia. Uh, uh, the study followed a random utility theory, which basically talks about uh, maximization of utility when a consumer is presented with different choices. And uh, this study followed, uh, it was a choice experiment and followed the district's choice experiment approach in a stated uh, preference uh, model. And the, uh, what you're seeing down there, the mathematics, this is the, uh, the model that was used in the study, which is called the mixed rotate. And I will not bother explaining that because basically it's just explaining uh, how the attributes from the labia uh, were mixed so that the, farm, uh, the consumers can actually select their choices. And this was the experimental design for the ex choice experiment and the survey development. Basically, the questions that were asked from the far, uh, for, for, for the consumers came from this picture you're seeing. So the choice experiment had five attributes uh, coming from uh, the fresh uh, tilapia, that size, color, setting type, uh, source, price. In terms of size, those are the attributes, small, medium, large, color, black, and silver, and then the package or sell selling per piece. And then in terms of source, coming from the cages, lake, or pond, and those are the prices. So a consumer would be asked uh, in a hypothetical situation, that if, if, if a fish is large, is silver in color, and is being sold per piece, and is coming from the cage, and is being offered at a 3,000 Maui quarter, uh, would you buy this? Uh, would we buy this fish? So that, those that that was the setup uh, of the questions, and there were several questions that these consumers were asked. In terms of the results, um, it was found that all the five attributes of the fish affected the choice, uh, consumer's choice of the fish. That's the price, uh, the color, and then the selling form, the source of the fish, and the size. But specifically, now one would ask, what's the ideal fish that the, the, the consumers now are looking for? So willingness to pay uh, were, were computed. And down there, uh, it was found that the consumer are willing to pay uh, $4.6 for a fish which is large seconded by a silver in color fish, and then fish which is sold in a packed manner, and lastly, fish coming from the lake. So already, this is a message uh, which is going to both the producers, the marketers, uh, and also researchers. On the second objective, where we looked at uh, the socioeconomic factors affecting the choice of a specific therapia attributes, uh, one of the factors that came significant was uh, uh, the residential status of uh, the consumers, that those who were resident in the high density areas, which are characterized by low incomes, were very sensitive to prices. Uh, so as the prices were changed, were increased, uh, more and more consumers rejected by uh, the therapy. And secondly, uh, an interaction between education of the consumers and the color black uh, showed a positive relationship, meaning that uh, those that had a higher education did not really mind about the black color, even though the study showed that uh, the black color was not uh, uh, preferred as shown by uh, preference in the silver color. And in conclusion, yes, the study found that all the five attributes uh, were uh, very important in informing the consumer in choosing what kind of fish they are supposed, they are, uh, they are supposed to buy. And so in that order, lake, uh, fish from the world sources, that's represented by lake, 
and those sold in the packed, uh, in, in, in the packages and those silver in color and the large fish were the ones that were preferred uh, by the by the consumers that's now the take home message to the uh, the private sector in this case specifically I'll mention Madego because uh, as I as, as I said Madego is a, a private sector partner in the aquafish and specifically this message was directed to them that they need to produce the attributes which have been mentioned above there if they are to maximize their sales uh, and, and profits and again because um prices where 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 prices uh those that the consumers that resided in high density areas were sensitive to prices the study recommended that um, the hedonic pricing model has to be taken into account where different pricing me uh, mechanisms have to be offered to different consumers uh again if they are to maximize their profits and then in terms of education uh the the the, uh, the Madego actually might want to intensify uh, the selling of uh, while they look for ways of how to make uh, the black jumbo look super as the consumers want. They might want to sell their products in the supermarkets in the cities where uh, a target where they specifically or deliberately target the, the, that class of people that are educated, high incomes, and then. Uh, Additional on recommendations, uh, the results from the study, as, as I mentioned, showed that the consumers prefer the silver color than the black color, which uh, the, the, the uh, tilapia from the cages is coming out. So more studies should be carried out on how to you know, turn that silver color into, I mean, turn the black color into silver. So the, again, the message that is directed to Madego and other private sector uh, producers of fish, especially tilapia, and also, there can be more studies that can be conducted on the cage culture tilapia in terms of the nutritive value, uh, which uh, one gets uh, after consuming uh, tilapia from the cages, because these are fish that are being uh, kept in the cages, are being fed, unlike uh, the wild tilapia. So studies might be, more researchers might want to conduct some studies in order to compare the nutritive value which they get when they consume uh, cage culture tilapia as compared to the wild tilapia. Uh, that again uh, is another recommendation. And then in terms of marketing, uh, in the meantime, the tilapia that is produced from the, cage, from the cages is still black. And the, this results from the study recommends that awareness campaigns have to be conducted to the consumers and the general public on why the, uh, the, the tilapia looks black because there have been uh, a lot of myths that these fish come from, uh, you know, the sewages and whatnot. Well, it's not true. And the, 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 the marketers, I mean, the marketing side of these private sectors or the producers need to take awareness campaigns to the public and explain that these fishes come from the cage and not the sewages and whatnot. And again, I'm happy to report that uh, there have been, in Malawi, there have been so many campaigns on the same, uh, uh, on why the fish comes out black. And the, uh, I'm sure because of this study, uh, several other, uh, these recommendations that have been done will be, made, uh, will be implemented by the producers uh, so that the fish comes out as the consumers need so that the companies maximize their profits and also that the, uh, the consumers maximize uh, their utility. In short, uh, it, it's, it's a brief presentation. Uh, that's what I had. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Francis, for a very good presentation. Can you st stop sharing your screen? I'm happy that this reflects the, 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 the kind of work that is, being is coming from your supervisors. And I'm also glad that you are, you are linking your study with the private sector, which is uh, exactly what we are looking for. So from now, we are going to ask Technopolis to make their presentation. And the, the presentation is uh, about sharing of findings from the recent process of verification. And the, we will also have the opportunity to ask them questions from what, what they, they, they are going to present. So, so here and Tim, uh, you are you are most welcome. 
Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so yes, as announced, um, uh, my colleague Anne Luce and I will be giving you an update on uh, the verification exercise that is uh, currently ongoing. Uh, so this is the verification of DLRS 2.2 up to 2.6. And if we start with uh, the verification, an update on the non-student um, related uh, DLRs. Uh, so just um, as a, a quick start um, to give you an update on where we are. Um, so we have now um, looked into the, the reports, the submissions that you have shared with us. Uh, we provided a first feedback um, on the data received um, to, to the ACEs. Um, and this was the opportunity for uh, the ACES to uh, provide further supporting documentation or, or correct um, any, any errors. Um, and based on that, uh, we conducted uh, verifications for uh, DLR uh, 2.3 on accreditations, 2.4 on partnerships and 2.5 on publications. Um, so a first uh, pre preliminary results um, are now ready um, and they are currently being uh, reviewed um, before they can be finalized and shared with you. So if we uh, share with you, um, so as mentioned, um, <clears throat> we're still, um, these are still draft results, but we can uh, have a look a little bit of where we are in terms of, of, of disbursements. Um, so for the non-student data, uh, we can see that uh, in two th uh, 2021, we, we are still um, increasing. So in particular for DLR 2.4 on partnerships, there has been um, some good progress. Um, and on 2.5, we're uh, now nearly uh, all the centers have reached the capped amount. Uh, we will have a look at that um, more in detail. Uh, so in our next slide, we can see the results for DLR 2.3 um, in terms of disbursement uh, by country. So these are aggregated uh, disbursements uh, percentages by country. And the first column here, um, uh, gives us uh, where we are for national accreditations. So we can see, for example, that for Malawi and Rwanda, all the centers have reached the cap amount of uh, three, 300K uh, uh, USD for national accreditations. Um, at the moment, um, uh, 16 ACEs have actually reached this cap amount for national accreditations. Um, and um, two ACEs have reached the cap amount of 600K. So that's the total for DLR 2.3. So this means that two ACEs have, uh, have uh, also um, reached the capped amount for, for international accreditation. Um, we know that three ACEs have not yet had any disbursements for DLR 2.3 um, and we will um, discuss a bit later the, the issues that, that, that have been encountered. So um, as we can see on the table, um, yeah, uh, Tanzania and Mozambique are, are a little bit lower for disbursements of DLR 2.3. If we look at results for uh, partnerships, um, so here um, we um, also see that um, about uh, half of the ACEs have reached the cap amount for DLR uh, 2.4. Um, and uh, we have very good results for Malawi and Kenya. Um, and two ACEs have not uh, yet received any disbursements for uh, DLR 2.4. And this is mainly because um, we have not yet been able to uh, validate a, pr a partnership with a private sector uh, company with a, a partner from uh, industry. 
So this was for DLR 2.4. Um, DLR 2.5. Um, so th this is a DLR where most of the, the ACEs, so 22 uh, ACEs, have reached the cap amount. So as you know, the, the, the cap amount was um, increased uh, in 2020. Um, so it's now 500K. Um, and we only have one, uh, one country, Mozambique, who, who, who still needs to um, um, increase uh, uh, results for this DLR. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, also um, another ACE, so the two ACEs with low disbursements rates for, for this um, DLR also in, in, um, in Ethiopia. Um, so lessons learned um, for these non for the non student data. So we can say that uh, in terms of uh, reporting, overall, the quality of the data that was shared with us was good. Um, a large majority of the centers have uh, used the feedback uh, provided by Technopolis on, on the data and uh, used this opportunity to provide additional information um, that has helped us um, uh, verify the data. Um, in terms of difficulties, um, yes, some, some centers have been using the wrong template, but, but this was also um, corrected when, when, uh, when mentioned and spotted. Um, so in terms of um, if, if we don't have the, the right template, it's sometimes difficult for us also to identify the, the, the newly submitted data. So um, we, we want to make sure um, this is um, correctly reported in the template with the, the date of, uh, of the newly submitted data. Um, and for, for the DLR 2.4, um, we still have some MOUs that, that um, cannot be validated because we have um, work plans and budgets that are not detailed enough. So what we need to check is we need to know who does what in the partnership and who funds what. Um, so we will also show you um, some examples of good practices for, for this. Um, so we recommend that you use the, the latest verification report um, that, that is shared with you to add new data. Uh, and please clearly indicate the date of, uh, of the submission of any new data in the template. Um, also uh, provide the relevant documentation to allow uh, verification. So for the um, accreditation for DLR 2.3, this would be the signed accreditation letters. And for DLR 2.4, this would be the signed MOUs with the work plan and budgets showing commitment of both partners. Um, so as mentioned earlier, um, two out of three ACEs have now reached the cap amount for national accreditation. But for those who haven't reached it yet, um, please share accreditation letters um, so that we can validate um, the uh, programs accredited. So um, the letters should specify the name of the program and the validity period. Um, the, uh, on this exercise, we had um, a self-assessment um, that, that was submitted. And um, th this is more complicated because for a self-assessment, um, uh, it, it should really have um, a, a number of uh, qualitative and quantitative mar markers um, that, that allow um, assessment of uh, the, the quality of the, uh, of the program. And um, it, it is um, uh, more, more difficult to, to, to validate if, uh, if these are not satisfactory. Um, so uh, I think um, uh, an accreditation from a national accreditation body uh, will be something um, stronger and easier to get approvement for. Um, some ACEs have, uh, I, I mentioned two ACEs that have 
submitted international accreditation, so accreditation of their programs from an international accreditation body. Uh, but also, uh, we would like to draw your attention on, on the new rules for international accreditation that um, are in the latest version of the operational manual, the PAD. Um, so uh, to, in order to make progress on this uh, DLR 2.3, you can also submit joint programs with an internationally accredited program. Uh, you can also submit a um, joint program with um, an institution um, included in a global ranking. So uh, if, if you have a joint program that is with um, an institution um, that um, is ranked in the top uh, 750, for example, of uh, the world university rankings. Um, that could also be look, looked at um, and, and, and uh, uh, approved. Uh, and the, the operational manual also mentions memberships in any discipline uh, specific international organization that has um, as its membership requirement the achievement of a number of qualitative and quantitative markers um, that, that would need to be uh, verified. For DLR 2.4, um, here we are showing examples of uh, good practices in terms of uh, what we um, are uh, uh, what we need to verify to approve uh, the MOUs. Uh, so, of course, I've mentioned earlier, the first step is uh, that we validate a partnership with an industrial partner. Um, uh, and uh, uh, then, so, so to validate that, or also to approve uh, partnerships with public institutions, we look at three things. So we looked at, we look at, um, do we have a detailed budget that, that shows contribution of each partner? So these contributions could be monetary or in kind, but um, uh, we, we should be able to, to trace who's contributing and how. Um, a detailed work, pl work plan that also shows um, a clear repartition of tasks um, that illustrates um, uh, collaborative partnerships, so tasks for each of the partners and a clear role of the partners in the, in the uh, collaboration. Um, and the third thing we look at is, uh, is the time frames, or the time frame, sorry. So the, the MOU must be valid for a period of uh, two years, minimum of two years. And here you could see examples of tables that, that are used by uh, some of the centers um, that give us clear, um, clear information that we need uh, to, to validate these partnerships. Um, and these tables are often um, in the appendixes of the MOUs. So when you share the MOUs, um, many of you um, send us scanned, um, scans of the MOUs, make sure that um, the appendices are, are also scanned and shared. And, um, and my colleague Anluz will now present the uh, update for student-related data. Good afternoon, all. Um, thank you very much, Sahar, and, and thank you, uh, Jonathan, Ayusea, and World Bank um, for, for the very well-hosted, organized uh, technical meeting that we've had. Um, we've also had our, uh, we've also had the clinics uh, yesterday and Tuesday, so um, I think both with regards to what Sahar has been sharing and what I will be sharing in the next few slides, we are very much aware that there's some, there have been some challenges, there have been some issues, um, and just would like to reiterate that we've, we've taken good note of those and that we'll bring those um, forward with uh, World Bank and IUCA when sharing the preliminary results. Um, also, to give you an update um, on, on the student verification, um, so we've also of course, dealing here with, with the participants to the ACE program, um, there has been an impact of COVID-19. Um, 
that led to a timeline that has shifted forward a little bit uh, and where we've also allowed for the survey period to be extended to six weeks. Um, what we've seen though is that normally, and, and this is in our experience, um, uh, very regular with, with online questionnaires is that in actually the last week and a half, despite the ex extension, we don't see a large increase anymore in terms of um, participants responding to the survey. Um, although we do send out weekly reminders and also through the, the non-response list that we share with you, we, we hope to still boost this um, response in the future. Um, with regards to the phone verification that was concluded yesterday and um, what we hear also done is that we've allowed for a wider time period uh, for students to be reached and we've um, agreed with the phone centers that they um, make at least three calls. In some instances that's more but that they try at least three times to reach the, the participants so that also there we've, we've done as much as we can to try and reach those um, participants who have not been able to uh, read through the survey. Um, currently, the survey response rate is at 66%. And since the, the phone results came in um, this morning, essentially, I can't give those uh, with you today, but my colleagues are working as we speak now to start the verification analysis. Um, in terms of um, improvement that we've made to the methodology and mainly to the survey, that is, um, We've made the satisfaction part um, optional. Um, uh, this was also in line with last year, but we've, we've kept on to that because that reduces the time that students or participants need to spend on the survey significantly, which we feel really benefits the, um, the response rates. Um, we've also um, made it more clear by leaving out redundant questions or things that may be too vaguely specified. Um, one of the key improvements is that um, we've, now automatically loaded into the questionnaire per student the name that you have shared with us in the excel reports and instead and and there we ask is this name correct um if so thank you for confirming if not could you please um note down what your correct name is so that also these type of maybe small uh, changes but they actually um led to a great improvement in terms of um verification results this is what we think and um, I think with the first analysis that's also what we've uh, we've been seeing um, so just to say where we are um, like I said we just um, had the verification calls and we've of course had the reports that were shared with with us um, that we then sent back around for feedback um, then we received the final um, final reports we had the verification survey launched um, which had been open for longer than, than normal. Um, and then we, um, we had the call. So now we'll be sharing the preliminary results with ISEA and World Bank next week. Um, and then we expect that towards the end of the month, we can provide them with the final verification reports um, with the complete disbursement overview. Um, so in terms of response rates, um, this is just a breakdown. I think what is most relevant is at least what's reassuring is that PhD with, of course, uh, the largest disbursement amount attached to it had quite a decent response rate, especially for these times. And also from our experience with the other ACE uh, West Africa project, that we know that the 81% uh, response rate is really laudable. So um, for all the m &E coordinators or the class coordinators who've been working on this, um, very well done. And same goes for master, that is not a bad uh, response rate percentage. Also bearing in mind again that those 26% of remaining students we are trying to call. Um, for exchanges, it's a little bit lower. And of course, for short course, it's a lot lower. And, and this is also something that we've heard back from many of you, that there's a challenge here, um, not only because, of course, these participants may be less attached to the centers, um, but also because in some instances they do not have access to email and in some instances not access to phone calls at all. And we'll be discussing um, in what way we can best respond to this. So that is that is a point well noted. Um, still, um, from our perspective, and I'm um, also hearing all the very inspiring stories, both from, from very well established professors to students, um, it is so clear that, that such great work and, and research is being 
being done and, and from our end we just hope to verify as many students which which in turn we need a high response rates for uh, so for next year please sensitize your students in time let them know um, when when IUCA communicates that that there's a survey coming that they need to watch their inbox um, and that is very important that they respond um, because that that is still the, the main pathway through which disbursement for these DLRs um, takes place. Um, in terms of lessons learned so far, like I said, unfortunately, um, I'm not, we've not been able to share results with you because of course the, the time was scheduled um, at this time when we wanted to give more time to, for, for the survey to actually take place um, and for the phone calls. So, um, I, I cannot go into depth in terms of verification rate, yes, but what, what I think is good to notice is that um, overall there was a good quality of reporting. However, with the resubmission, so once we, we shared feedback, um, in some instances we got um, very, we, we got feedback, for instance, in Word documents, whilst from the very start of ACE2 it's been clear that all submissions and resubmissions need to be um, submitted through use of the right template. So I, I would really like to restate that um, we are dealing with um, thousands and thousands of records. The only way that we can, op we can operate this in an efficient manner is that we receive the standardized uh, templates. Um, and so please use those when reporting back and when, when taking back um, our feedback in the, in the new submissions. Um, with regards to uh, the communication we um, we took to heart very much also the previous feedback that was given on on um, the accent or language um, <laughs> differences that there were with the with the call center we were using. So we've approached the Kenyan phone operator. So hopefully to decrease language barriers. Again, here we are aware that not everyone um, is as proficient in English, but here also that the phone. Um, verification is sort of an added option um, and I think in some specific instances like with some of the short courses we have to see what the best option are but overall we had um, good feedback also from just this afternoon from the phone operator that overall people uh, female can I please amend this um, we've been able uh, to also allow for this so um, I see my internet connection was unstable I hope you've been able to follow um, but overall um, I think we're looking to uh, to a final wrap up of this student verification in the near weeks um, and we'll be discussing some of the challenges um, also with uh, with ISCA and, and World Bank um, I know it's been an intense week and I think it's the end of the afternoon of quite some uh, very inspiring but uh, intense session. So I wanted to keep it brief. Thank you so much. Um, I think Jonathan, that's, uh, that's back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for making this presentation uh, very brief but uh, informative. And uh, now I open this uh, presentation for discussion and the I saw the first person to ask to raise his hand was the Professor Luis from uh, Mozambique. Uh, yes, Jonathan. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Technopolis for the good presentation. Uh, and in behalf of our center in Mozambique for oil and gas, I would like to say that uh, definitely you are not happy. Uh, you are not happy in the, with the lowest performance in some of the important indicators and results. Uh, I think that this is uh, something that has to do with uh, some internal issues that you have had uh, in terms of, uh, I would say, structural issues, some communications issues that you have had. And uh, uh, we end up even having a failure in responding on time to the data submission 
for the last uh, fifth, uh, fifth round. This was really bad because we have some information, some data that was not was not uh, uh, submitted to this round, and definitely some of the numbers would change. Uh, I believe that uh, not being able to submit now, you will be able to submit on the next round in a cumulative way, and you expect that our numbers will be much better. So. Uh, um, the commitment that I would like to, 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 to stress here is that uh, as a center, you are really committed in meeting the results and the goals that the project has been discussing. We have been discussing a lot with the World Bank. Uh, last week, we had a mission from the World Bank, Jonathan and Agnes, they came to Mozambique and we appreciate that very much. And also have been, uh, sorry, I said World Bank, but actually as you say, sorry for that. But also we have been discussing with the World Bank team uh, in Mozambique, uh, but also yesterday we had a very important and uh, interesting discussion with the World Bank team, uh, more specifically with Roberta. And uh, what we have to stress is that uh, you are committed uh, still to, to improve and uh, the recommendations that you are giving us definitely will serve to, to, to make that, uh, that, that, that step forward in that direction. So this is just to, 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 to a brief statement about the results that have not been so good, but definitely you believe that they are going to, to change in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Luigi. We were there. I, the confidence is very good. I, I'm sure, as you said, once you're given the opportunity this time around, the team is there and the, I'm sure we'll generate a lot of data for submission. The, the other comfort I got from your our discussion when we visited you is that you still have some money that you can run business. So we are not shutting down the center. You still have good money to continue the activities. Now I invite Joseph Semakula from Akalise to also ask his questions. Joseph, are you there? I, I, I can yes, see your you. camera is on. Yes, I'm there. Yes, thank you very much. Jonathan, my, my question goes to Technopolis. Um, a lot of our students and uh, uh, faculties, external students, had problems in submitting the form after filling it. I actually asked them to communicate to Technopolis because there was uh, information that if you find problem, please communicate to us. They communicated back and uh, Technopolis was telling them that please fill the form again or change the browser. Uh, I wonder what, I don't know if it reaches submit and they fail to submit. Then you're told maybe there is a field you didn't fill properly. Uh, the students who are calling me and other faculties for exchange were calling me and they were saying I filled the form which is supposed to take 15 minutes. I filled it for two days that I can't submit. I don't know what the cause of this is or whether some ACEs, other ACEs made this kind of problem. So some of our, our exchange students especially did not uh, submit. We have got some, we got some students on short courses from Tanzania on organic agriculture culture who we are two faculty researchers from Kawanda Research Station. So is there any is meet this? Um, why I'm asking this is that so that we improve next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Uh, I think that, that question is noted by, by Technopolis, they'll respond. I saw a question from Rose uh, Ramkat. Uh, this is, I think, from uh, Petre. Rose, are you there? Yes, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, my question is to take. First, I want to ask uh, the, the concern about the students who have graduated. What are they going to do? Because currently, it looks like the template is this. If they could give us feedback on what we can do so that we can you know, solve this problem of the students, particularly the master students who have graduated already, because the longer we wait for them to send maybe a call to them, then they will even forget that you know, this was 
these were procedures that were needed, and particularly that many of them have gone back to their home country, it might start to become difficult to trace them and to trace them you know, quickly to respond to calls. Then I was wondering when could be the next round for the non-student data? Thank you. Those are the two questions, Jonathan. I appreciate the chance. Thank you very much, Rose. Uh, Technopolis, uh, are you there uh, to respond to those questions? Uh, you yes. start with start or, or whoever is ready to start. Um, maybe I can start with the first question um, from, I believe it was Akalais, thank you very much, um, with the issue on submission of the, of the different students. Um, I think what, um, what is maybe a good way forward also for, for next time. So far we haven't, we haven't run into large problems with this, um, with, with what you described. Indeed, it was good to, to redirect the students to the help desk. Um, I would also like to stress that um, although there may, they may have not seen or received a confirmation email that, that, have, that they have fully submitted the, the questionnaire, every answer that they fill in is automatically saved. This is also a safeguard for us to indeed, when an internet connection breaks up, we do have all the answers that they have submitted until that point. Um, as, as I'm not specifically aware of the, of the specific details around the cases of the, the students you just described, um, we also use the help desk to further verify through additional information. Um, so I, I would be surprised if it would have led to a large um, problem in this instance. However, for next time, when you receive these, these um, complaints or these en encounter these issues, could I kindly ask you and any other center who has this to communicate this um, through IUCEA uh, so that we can look into it as it is happening, so that we can respond on time and deal with it immediately. Um, that I think will solve it sooner for you, for the students, and, and for us, it will also be easier to deal with it on the spot. So um, that would be my, my advice for next year. Um, with regards um, to the question on um, students who have graduated, um, thus far, the, the past stipulates we, we do a one-time, one-year verification for um, the student or participant um, data. Um, I don't know if there's options to, to think about the timing for next year, um, but in, in lieu of that, I would ask that through alumni offices, you, you keep in touch, you make sure that you have the correct email addresses. And when next year we are uh, starting the new round that you send an email to those who graduated last year, uh, making them aware that this is taking place again. Um, from our experience also with the West African ACES, this is something that works well to alert current and past students of the fact that the verification round is happening again. Um, and it also makes them more, more uh, attuned to expecting this email. Uh, so Herr, would you like to address the question on the non-student verification? Yes, thank you. And Luz, um, on the non-student verification, um, uh, I mean, we usually we do up to two verifications per, per year on non-student data. We only do one on student data because, of course, this involves um, a survey in contacting the students um, and it is um, a heavier exercise. But uh, uh, for, for non-student data, if um, if this is aligned with the, the plans for IUCEA and, and the World Bank, um, that we, we could perform one uh, in, in, in fall. So that would be around uh, uh, maybe October. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have two more questions. One comes from uh, a group of Wise Futures and Creates. Go ahead, please. Yeah, um, thank you, Jonathan. This is alike from Wise Futures. Huh? We are here together with Creates. Uh, just one question on the, um, on the presentation on the national accreditation uh, status in Tanzania. Seems like it's 25%. Uh, we are confident that two centers, Wise Futures and Creates, we already uh, finished that. 
uh, DLI, but it, it seems like the percentage is 25%. I don't know how they calculated and reached there. That's only clarification we need from you. Okay, they, they noted your question. Uh, Jude from uh, Akalise, you are following up from Joseph's questions. Thank you very much. No, mine is different. Okay. It's a kind of a suggestion that mm -hmm. um, it would be ideal that we get the plan in advance for the verifications, such that within a year, we know exactly it is May or it is October when verification is going to take place. Because sometimes uh, the notification comes really at quite a short notice. We pray that uh, Technopolis can give a plan in advance, maybe for the year's plan, such that we plan accordingly. Thank you very much. Okay, that is a suggestion. Though we are always trying to communicate it in a good time. But I, I think what you are, you are asking is to have a, a, an annual plan for all verification events. Yes, right? annual plan. Okay. Just good. like the, just like all the the various centers have work plans, I yeah. think Technopolis can also have a work plan as far as the verifications are concerned, and it is shared in advance. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, I think we are done with the questions. There was only one thing we, I don't know why you did not talk about uh, the exchange issues, the challenge for exchange. We probably have to consider uh, having virtual environment for exchange. And the, given the situation now, like now in Uganda, all universities are closed again for, for the two days, which is again it, going to delay and it may also affect the exchange that we, we plan to do in this year. So we probably have to, to put our heads together to consider virtual exchanges and the way they can be validated. So this is something that we are thinking and I'm going to, to pose this challenge to the World Bank and ourselves to see how best we can continue the exchange, but we do the virtual because like now we've been doing this meeting for, one, for the whole week and the, we can record this and be able to provide the evidence that actually this happened in one of the centers. So that will be a discussion for, for the next round and the, I think we, we shall come with some recommendation how best to do it virtually. I, I leave this for Technopolis to, to have with their closing words and we we'll move on to the next uh, level of the program. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, yes, indeed, on, uh, on the point uh, of having uh, clarity on when, when the, these exercises are, are taking place, um, I, I think we, we, should, we, we should remind, uh, uh, clarify at least that uh, um, these exercises are, are taking place each year at the same moment. Um, so uh, the, the big exercise verification of the student uh, data and non-student data always takes place every year in spring. Uh, so generally it starts in March um, and ends uh, around June. Um, so um, you can expect that um, every year uh, this will take place at this moment. Um, and then we could do an, an additional uh, non-student data uh, around um, October, November, um, also every year. So it's always uh, the sort of the, the same period uh, of time. And, and uh, this should give you, um, uh, of course, the opportunity to prepare in advance um, and, uh, and have your data ready uh, for these exercises. And um, yeah, we would like to, to thank everyone for, for, for their questions and uh, for, for the submissions. So. And uh, as, as explained, we are now uh, finalizing the exercises and hope to share with you results um, as soon as possible. Um, at the moment, these are draft results and as uh, indicated, they need to be uh, reviewed um, uh, before, before they are finalized and shared with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Technopolis and the team for very good work. And I'm well, glad that you, your intervention has been uh, helping us to improve the way we deliver on verification. Now we're moving to breakout rooms. We have only two rooms today. Uh, one room is on environmental and the, and the social safeguard. The other one is on social development. 
So, so Jonathan, sorry to interrupt, but given that one of our colleagues has to leave in half an hour, we decided yeah. not to do the breakout rooms. Instead, we will have both uh, Svetlana and Kudakwesh uh, lead this session together. So I invite them to uh, you know, lead the session. Oh, we're not moving to any breakaway rooms. We're staying here, right? Yes, we're staying here. OK, good. Yeah. Thank you. So Svetlana, over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Svetlana Khvastova. I'm an environmental specialist um, with the World Bank based in Washington, uh, D.C. And I'm joined today by my social colleague uh, who will introduce himself. Kuda, over to you. Um, hello, colleagues. So I'm Kuda Kwasha, Dube Social Development Specialist based in Lusaka, Zambia. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, Today, uh, sorry, my screen disappeared. Uh, so today we'd um, we would like to um, um, hear a little bit uh, uh, from you on the updates, uh, what, was, um, what was done um, from the last uh, World Bank mission, what was done on environmental and social risk management in the project, um, and um, perhaps answer any questions that you may have uh, about the safeguards. So just as a reminder, uh, the World Bank has uh, safeguard this environmental and social risk management, what we call safeguards requirements, um, uh, which uh, uh, requires every project to be screened. This has to do most, mostly with projects that have some works. Uh, uh, this is on the environmental side. Kuda will talk about the projects that uh, need to be, that uh, social risks for the, for, for the projects at the level of institutions. And uh, based on the screening, as you know, the environmental and social management plans uh, uh, need to be developed. This is uh, in line or even environmental assessments uh, based uh, on the regulations of each country and the World Bank requirements as well. Um, and then these plans have to be uh, put in place. And also um, uh, after, after the uh, the risk management measures of uh, ESMPs are, are put together. Uh, the, uh, the monitoring and screening will need to uh, it needs to be done uh, during implementation. So um, it, it would be great to hear uh, perhaps from each uh, um, uh, maybe um, um, to, sorry I don't know how the um, the the group is organized today. Um, because we're just joining for this session, but it would be gr great to hear from the ACES participating organizations on um, uh, how, whether there is any focal point on environmental social um, issues uh, within the institution and whether there were any in the last uh, six months, uh, five months, there were any um, projects done with, um, with environmental social risks. Uh, so were there any ESMPs developed? And how do you approach your uh, progress reporting? Uh, is there any structure, any monitoring um, information that you, you're attempting to put in your progress reports? So basically we're more with questions today, less so with presentation, unless there is a, there is a wish to, uh, to have a specific um, question answered. Um, so probably we'll stop here. This is just the general points. Um, could there anything to add at this stage? Uh, maybe one, well, one, one issue that I can add is, um, um, I think Sukhlana, you outlined, I think, all the key issues under environmental and social risk management as required for, the, uh, for this project. So maybe one key issue that we discussed in the previous mission is, you know, the functionality of the grievance redress mechanisms. So I think it would be good uh, if uh, different institutions can also, you know, ask us questions or share with us their experience in implementing the GRM. I think what is not clear in some institutions is, you know, what, what are the grievance risk mechanisms that are available? How are um, students and, you know, other projects affected parties uh, submitting any sort of feedback uh, with relation to the implementation of the project and how is uh, sort of different, you know, uh, AC, institutions are responding uh, to, to that uh, to, to, to those uh, uh, grievances or particularly I mean in general sometimes they can be just feedback and I think we have made a, a request that um, going forward uh, in, in their sort of um, either quarterly or biannual reports they, they should have a section uh, you, you know with, with um, an update in terms of uh, you know the sort of the nature the number 
and the resolution status of you know grievances that the um, the institutions are receiving. So I think that that's one area that I'm very interested in, just to find out uh, from from the various institutions connected. Uh, over. So perhaps with the, at this stage we'd like to turn over to the to the participants, but I will display the these uh, these. Uh, I think we we collected now four questions from the bank, uh, so that you can structure your um, uh, your remarks uh, based on these questions. So if you give me a moment, can um, can display the slide. But uh, meanwhile, um, um, feel free to start. Any any volunteers to share their experience on these questions? Um, grievance redress mechanism. Um, any projects with works and any ESM environmental social management plans developed in the last five months, um, approach to the progress reporting, um, and um, any uh, approach to the um, monitoring, so any focal points at the, at the organization level. Bernard has raised his hand. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, I, I, I thought uh, we could actually uh, start just to, to, uh, to keep the ball rolling. I think from our end, um, uh, when it comes to actually the, the environmental and the social safeguards, uh, I think the last time we had the meeting with the, with the bank, we were, we were properly guided. But from inception, what was required was actually done. But at the moment, currently, we are doing the, the rehabilitation. And these, uh, these rehabilitations that we're actually doing, that is rehabilitating the labs and the, the offices. So there are such things such as the, the noise pollution and the uh, um, dust, all those aspects. I think the, these aspects have been adequately addressed by, the, by the, the company that is actually involved, that is involved in the, the, the construction or in the, the renovation where they have barricaded the place. And uh, then the, the university, as much as possible, they have actually tried by all means to, to make sure that the, uh, the impact is actually negated. And this, they are working very closely with the resident engineer. And this resident, uh, the resident engineer is actually part of the university who understands the rules that guide uh, whatever renovations that actually uh, take place in the, in the university. Then on one hand, I think uh, on these environmental and social safeguards, I think in the, the event or in the advent of uh, COVID, uh, where we are now, um, uh, COVID has really become a very uh, um, important thing that we, we have to do things with it. So we are following all the, the laid down procedures by the, by the government that have been set, like at the moment now, there is a, a third wave in Zambia, and this uh, third wave demands that uh, a, a students be restricted. So as much as possible, we are confining ourselves to, to virtual interactions, and those that need the practical aspects, um, the number of people that are supposed to be in the lab or in the laboratories at that particular time has actually been, been minimized. So the investor has actually issued guidelines that, uh, especially when it comes to the support staff, the support staff, as much as possible, they are actually supposed to, to stay home. It's only one or two that are actually supposed to be in the laboratory at that particular time. And then the students, of course, uh, the three important uh, systems or mechanisms that are actually employed to minimize the, the COVID are actually done. And when immediately the student shows, let's say, uh, sneezing or coughing, these are immediately uh, uh, they are tested to actually determine their status. And if they are found positive, then they are expected to follow the, the, routine, the routine guidelines. And when it comes to the grievance redress, mechan uh, redress mechanism, I think the office, in our case, we have actually received uh, um, some, some complaints, especially when it comes to, to the house that is actually at the, um, uh, the house where our international students are actually residing, and the, the problem the, the the problem that was actually there was in terms of uh, the payment of the electricity bills, where everyone in the house has to actually uh, contribute towards the the, the the bill. And it was found out that, that there are some that literally wanted to hold their money into their hands and didn't want 
to release that money. So the few students actually brought the, the, the case to our, to our management office. And the, when it was brought to our management office, then the, our project manager had to go to the house to meet these students, and then a mutual agreement was actually arrived at. And at the same time, this particular problem was actually recorded in the university system, especially the, the, the properties manager who, uh, who actually oversees these properties that there is that complex. And then uh, the usual university um, way of reporting these mechanisms, the center has actually been incorporated into the system where the problem has to go to, to, the, to the assistant dean for postgraduate, then to the dean, then the dean follows the, the routine university system. Thank you very much. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, 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 we, we go ahead with the questions from uh, any contribution from other members. Uh, let me see. It seems we don't have any other questions, right? Or, if, or if comments. Um, I also uh, received the um the report um from Dixon. Um so maybe we can also show the um the what kind of a grievance that the ACES have been receiving. And then we can show that uh, on the screen if that helps. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Sauri. So I was not able to open it while I was sharing the screen. So would or would you like to uh, me to open it or uh, or would you like? Oh to yeah, if you yeah, if you. Because I'm um, just since I have just um, received it, I don't know the the structure of it, but we'll try to scroll through. Yeah, I think if you open the end the GRM report on the. Uh, the right. word document, I think that would be okay. good. Um, give me just one second then. Oh. All right, so let me share the, okay, where is it, okay. Um, can you see the GRM, the grievance report on your screen? Yes. Perfect. So, um, since uh, Dixon has uh, summarized this, perhaps he can also um, guide through how how we can, I mean, how you summarize, perhaps. Yes, thank you, Sauri. Uh, we received uh, reports from the centers and uh, like uh, recommended in the previous aid memoir, we, we, we tried to request SS to, to categorize the grievances. So uh, when you look at uh, the first, the first, there were three SS that uh, did not uh, reported grievances, but they were not categorized. That is the first up and categorized, the three S's. They reported 26 grievances, 16 were resolved, 10 are pending. So I think we will need to offer more guidance to S's. The other one were issues to do with the facilities. And uh, when you look under, there were 28 grievances, all the 28 were resolved, 10 no, uh, and, 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 and they were mainly about uh, uh, due to uh, internet connectivity services offered by the university during the, the online teaching. And uh, the other one were related to verification, which Akalisa has, <clears throat> has uh, already put forward. The issues uh, where students were complaining that they were unable to submit the online forms 23 cases were reported to Akalisi. They were only able to resolve one. So I think uh, the majority of the 20, out of the 20, the other one, the 
there were two which were reported by another center. Yes, this was a wise future. Uh, they, I think there were some students that needed clarification on the verification process that the center was able to, to take them through. So those two were resolved. So the 22 that were appending were related to Akalise. The other one were academic related uh, grievances reported by six S's, 18 were registered, eight were resolved, 10 are pending, nine were related to payment of uh, research funds, uh, six were unresolved at Wise Future. Uh, the ones at Wise Future, it wasn't so clear, but uh, it looked like uh, students were requesting for an extended period uh, for them to receive facilitation to do research uh, I, I think they can they can they can explain that further then there were cases due to the war in the tigray region in ethiopia some three students are affected they are unable to conduct their research that was reported by one of the center in tanzania then there were two cases by on a student wanting their phd proposal to be re-examined and uh, an aptitude test case that was in Ethiopia. Then there were issues to, to do with a delayed approval of a <clears throat> concept and a PhD defense. And then there was an issue on a supervisor not being available. That is academic related issues that came up. Uh, then there were issues to do with their welfare. These were mainly related to delayed payments of stipend and staff salary. There were 14 cases, all were resolved. And then there were COVID-related grievances. And this, this mainly, were there they, they were 15, 10 were resolved, five are still pending. And uh, these were mainly related to travel restriction. Uh, and as Jonathan just stated, in Uganda, the schools and the universities have been closed, travel within certain <clears throat> public transports have been also restricted. So these were mainly what we received as of, uh, I think, a seventh. But again, we received the two additional reports yesterday, which are not here. But uh, in total, 126 cases of grievances were registered, 79 were resolved, 47 are uh, pending. So briefly, that's what we managed to pick out from the reports that we received from ACES. Thank you. Yeah, and then also I think if you go down, there's uh, measures that have been in place um, in the ACES for to manage the COVID-19, if you also want to go through that. Yes, and uh, also when we, when we received the reports, we, we also went through the COVID prevention measures that are being uh, put in place by ACES, 15 ACES out of the 24 shared with us some updates on the measures that they have put in place. So uh, one, all the 15 uh, reported that they are adhering to the national guidelines for management of COVID in their respective countries. That is uh, wearing of mask while in public places, hand washing, uh, uh, temperature monitoring, social distancing, discouraging the poorly ventilated spaces and use of sanitizers, among others. The other thing was uh, limiting face-to-face -face events, which involves mass gatherings. And uh, so there, there, is a, there is a bigger shift towards the online teaching, online meetings. Uh, then the other thing is, uh, yeah, the online teaching is, there, is also the other one, and then use of recorded lectures. Uh, sharing of daily updates from the ministry. They have also created some WhatsApp groups within their, their, their centers where they share updates from their respective Ministry of Health for awareness. The other one is encouraging staff and students above 40. This was happening in two cases. Staff about student and staff about above 40 years of age to vaccinate. This was noted in uh, Akalisi and the Insta Food in Kenya. The other one was holding virtual graduation. Akalisi reported they do virtual, they've done virtual graduation. Provision of isolation facilities. Uh, this was only reported in one center in Rwanda. 
encouraging testing for COVID, taking part in ongoing applied research. I think we've seen a very good research from SACID also. Uh, CD, CDT also are doing quite a handful of uh, research. They highlighted them in their report. Support to safe working environment for staff and then supervision meetings being with, between student and staff being virtually conducted. And then finally, minimizing troubles. They only do that when they cannot avoid it. So these were some of the things we managed to pick from the reports. Thank you. Thank you, Dixon. Do you have any feedback from the, the World Bank colleagues or is any other ACE want to add? Um, I, I do have something. I don't know, Svetlana, maybe I, I can give you an opportunity to, to come. Uh, no, I think Kuda, it's more it's more uh, logical uh, because we looked at the grievances um, right now. So uh, please go ahead with your point. I was just worried about your time. Do, do you need to leave in 10 minutes? Um, um, yeah, so uh, thank you, thank you. Yes, I, I was not focusing more on the presentation. So perhaps um, just, uh, just a couple of uh, points. So thank you, just, just looking at the um, reports that were submitted so far. Um, so encouraging the teams to continue identifying and sharing good practices. Um, and also um, I'm, uh, requesting that if any, there is any formal ESMP or an environmental assessment done to forward it to the bank, uh, just uh, because we have to, we have to sample and review the, some of these documents. Um, a couple of examples, just uh, quickly scanning through the reports from different institutions. Uh, for, um, uh, for instance, Aquafish has has there been any ESMP done? Because there's some risks that were that were mentioned in the report. Then also CDT. Um, Africa. Also, there is a, there is a discussion in the uh, in the. Um, uh, safeguards reporting about uh, the water resource protection plan and it says uh, that it was embedded in the standard operating procedure um, and then the attachments only provide the templates but uh, was there an actual assessment done so in, in, in as a general point encourage you to uh, to share any um, any available documentation with uh, with the bank for review um, and uh, pro and commending the team on on the COVID nineteen prevention measures uh, uh, put in place uh, and the creativity um, um, and the due diligence because this is something that uh, it is a very it was a very important factor uh, in the last year um, probably from the general points that's it and I will be able to respond more in writing and perhaps as part of the aid memoir. And then uh, happy to have any follow-up uh, discussion after the after the mission or uh, using another opportunity. But before you go, there is a question from Professor Bale. Yes, please. Professor Bale, are you still there? Uh, Jonathan, uh, good afternoon again. Good afternoon. Yeah, it was not a question as such. I just wanted maybe to. Uh, um, with the time, maybe just to summarize some of GRM at the Copper Belt Invest Africa Center of Excellence for Sustainable Mining. Yeah, we did also present some of the grievances uh, experienced by our students. Uh, many of them are emanating from the hostels. What happened that our hostels are new, they are undergoing some rehabilitations. And uh, what happened that we find that some of the installations they are not yet finished as, 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 as such. So what we have done is that uh, we have the, the office of the what, Dean of Students. Uh, we have reported all the cases uh, uh, pertaining to, to, to the installations in the students' rooms, which have been uh, fixed time to time, like the, um, some, maybe some bulbs, some uh, pipes for water and so forth since they're still undergoing rehabilitation. Uh, so we, uh, we wish to report that all that is, uh, has been done. Uh, whatever is, is not yet done, uh, we have got uh, 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 what our system whereby the student, uh, um, they fill in what the forms for their grievances, and then uh, we, we pass to the relevant authority to attend to them, and which they have been uh, attended, uh, attended to. Otherwise, these are some of the what 
the grievance I wanted to present at our CB Africa Center for Sustainable Mining. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mbare. Uh, uh, any, any other issues that the World Bank want to say before I close the meeting for today? Um, so just uh, briefly from my side, maybe let me just share briefly um, one slide on the grievance redress mechanism in terms of you know what uh, what are the minimum elements that we we expect uh, from from the team this is just a reminder but at least from from the presentation uh, that, that you have shared with us uh, so far this is uh, I mean seems like you know many uh, I, I, um, institutions have functional uh, grievance redress mechanism um, I don't know if you can see anything now. Uh, am I sharing something? Can you can you see the, the yes, slide? Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I've seen and I think the whole, the whole group has seen what you showed. Ah, okay, great. I don't know if I put it in presentation mode, whether it will, is it still there? Yes. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, so what I wanted to say is uh, just a few things in terms of the uh, grievance redress mechanism, in terms of what we mean by effective grievance redress mechanism. And this is just to reiterate, I'm sure you have been uh, appraised of this information at some point, but what I wanna emphasize is, um, I think for the all institutions, we'll share also this information is, I think one important thing is that there has to be several you know, channels through which uh, students and you know, other project staff can, can submit um, the you know the, the the grievances that they may have, uh, so the, this doesn't. Uh, I mean, I'm not 100 percent aware of what is available, but my understanding and my assumption is that this is built up, you know, on uh, existing systems that the universities have, which is you know good practice and best practice across you know many projects. We don't need to start from scratch, but if there are gaps, you can improve in terms of how. Uh, people can uh, submit their grievances. I, I know maybe students, they are sending either emails or WhatsApp uh, messages as part of the mechanism. I'm just making this up, but, but I don't know how they are submitting the grievances, but it just ensure that, you know, they, it's very clear to, to the students and uh, other affected uh, and other project stakeholders in terms of how they can actually submit grievances. And then well, one other issue, I think this is just repetition of probably things that are happening that you you, you can uh, acknowledge, you know, that you have received to the complaints, uh, complainants, and then um, you also provide, you know, a very clear time frames uh, through which, you know, this can be processed and, you know, resolved. And uh, also there should be clear procedures for, for escalation and appeal. I mean, if students, or I'm, I'm referring to students because most of the grievances you, you have indicated that came from students. So if they are not happy uh, and you know it's not resolved, you know at that level, uh, are there issues? Are, are there other avenues that they can appeal? You know, in terms of you know the resolution that that that, that, that might have been provided. Um, yeah, I see that you are tracking the grievances, which is uh, uh, very good. I think I haven't opened all the reports, but the summary that you have presented shows that you know at least every institution is reporting on the grievances. Which is commendable. We made that recommendation, and uh, seems like uh, almost all the institutions are on board to do that. Um, and probably one last issue I want to mention on this slide is um, issues of uh, sexual exploitation and sexual harassment. So we we do have um, you know um, cases like that that happens. I think uh, it's a risk for this project. I mean, considering the number of institutions that are available and uh, sort of, you know, the dynamics that happens at uh, higher learning institutions. So what I wanted to emphasize here is one, there has to be a way through anyone who feels that, you know, they, they have been uh, sort of um, uh, exposed or they've been harassed or sexually exploited. They should have, a, a, there should be mechanism through which they can submit their grievances in a, in a very confidential way. Uh, and they should know about, you know, availability of those channels. And also for the bank side, if you, there is any grievance re related to GBV, SEA, okay, that's sexual exploitation and sexual harassment, please notify us within uh, 48 hours because we do have our internal procedure. So I want to reiterate that uh, for the institutions, if you receive any grievance related to 
sexual harassment, sexual exploitation and abuse, please notify uh, the TTO Saori, notify the environmental and social colleagues as soon as possible so that we can be able to guide you in terms of how that can be, can be processed. Um, just lastly, I know we are out of time. A couple of things that I wanted just to, um, to emphasize here is um, uh, also I think for the whole team that is here, like sometimes, you know, there may be some gaps in terms of, you know, how fun functional the grievances uh, mechanism, the GRM uh, sort of, you know, how, how, uh, how, how is it functioning? If there are issues to do with, you know, budget, please uh, uh, reach out to us, particularly the, the task team, because uh, we do require that, you know, there should be budgetary support to operationalize uh, these grievance redress mechanisms. So I think part of that budget goes to, uh, you know, creating awareness around, you know, the available uh, mechanisms. Um, yeah, I think that's all that I want to, uh, I wanted to say. I think I'm happy that, you know, the, the reporting is going on. So I, I will pause here and we will continue this discussion. Um, um, I mean, as and when it is needed. So I'll pause here and uh, over to, to you, uh, Mr. Jonathan. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think tomorrow we'll also have a session where we're going to have overall feedback from you. So it will still be tabled for discussion if we have another uh, takeaway communication you want to make for, for, the, for us too. Otherwise, uh, Saori, do you have anything to say? Uh, no, I'm fine. And thank you everyone um, for uh, submitting the data all the time. Uh, it's really helpful. And then I think it's good to share the summarized results um, every um, six months in the mission so that everyone is aware of what's happening. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, now we have we, we've come to the end of this uh, program for today. And I want to say thank you very much for staying with us. It has been a long day, I'm sure, but we, as you, could, you, you saw from the presentation, uh, our time was not wasted. There was a lot of good things that we shared today. And I think uh, as, a, as a family, we, 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 we must uh, be proud of what is going on with, our, with the centers. So let's, let us meet again tomorrow. Tomorrow we are starting at one uh, East African time and the, uh, I hope we shall finish within uh, the planned time. The breakaway rooms tomorrow will be sector specific. So agriculture will be going to their room and industry, health, education and statistics. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make this announcement again tomorrow. So I wish you all the best and have a good day or a good evening rather. Thank you very much. Nice evening and nice day too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Well, end the meeting.